Good evening. Um, we called the closed session at 5 o'clock p.m. and it is now 6.03. And I'd like to call this meeting to order and announce the board met in closed session. And under item number two, conference with legal counsel, anticipated litigation, significant exposure to litigation. Conference with legal counsel concerning initiation of litigation against Jewel Labs Incorporated for damages stemming from vaping pursuant to government code section 549546.9D4. The board gave direction to initiate litigation with a unanimous vote and all board members present. Good evening, welcome to the Elk Grove Unified School District's virtual board meeting through the Zoom webinar platform. We thank you for joining us and ask for your patience in advance as we navigate this somewhat new platform for conducting school board meetings. Legislative bodies, including school districts, are now permitted to hold board meetings telephonically or by other electronic means because on March 17, 2020, the governor issued Executive Order N2920, suspending certain provisions of the California Ralph and Brown Act. In addition, consistent with the March 19, 2020 statewide shelter in place order issued by the governor, executive order N3320, the Sacramento County shelter at home orders issued on March 19th, 2020 and April 7th, 2020 and the Center for Disease Control Social Distancing Guidelines meeting is conducted via the Zoom webinar platform. Public comments can be submitted to the board on items on the me board meeting agenda and also on items that do not relate to the agenda, but are within the board's jurisdiction. Tonight is noted on the board's agenda and district website, all electronic public comments that were submitted to the board through the Google platform will be provided to the board in writing relative to the appropriate agenda item. We have two sets of comments re not related to a board item and we have asked them to choose along with the names if provided, and all copies will be sent to the board as previously done. Is there any objection? Thank you. Please be advised that everyone participating via Zoom webinar is muted and all board members will be, all board votes will be by a roll call. Members of the board present tonight are myself, President Beth Albiani, Board Clerk Crystal martinez Alir. Board Member Nancy Cheris Espinoza, Board Member Carmine Forcina, Board Member Member Bobby Singallen. In addition to the Zoom webinar meeting, Beth, you didn't yep. mention you stumbled over Chet's uh, name; it, it stopped on you. So can you make sure? Oh, I'm so sorry, Chet. It was not intentional. Mr. And Chet Madison and Mr. Perez as well. Mr. Tony Perez, we got gotcha. you. Um, Thank you. Today's Zoom webinar meeting is being video recorded and will be available on the district's YouTube channel. I will warn you now we are having a little freezing issue, so I apologize and please do speak up and help me. I will help other speakers if I can see it. Pledge of Allegiance. I would like to ask Mr. Hoffman if he would lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, one nation under God, God indivisible, God. with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Mr. Hoffman. We'll start with our student expulsion involuntary transfer recommendations. Number one, request for return from student expulsion. Ms. Pinkerton, is there any public comment related to this item? Madam Board President Albiani, there are no public comments related to this item. Thank you. I'd like to call for a motion and a second to approve the request for return from student expulsion. I move approval of return from student expulsion. I'll second it. Thank you. This is a roll call vote. Ms. Singh Allen? Aye. Mr. Perez? Aye. Mr. Madison? Aye. Dr. Martina Salir? Aye. Ms. Cheris Espinoza? Aye. Mr. Forchina? Aye. And myself as an aye, that's unanimous, thank you. Number two, 
denial of expulsion readmission request. Ms. Pinkerton, is there any public comment related to this item? Comments related to this item? No comments? No comments. Thank you. You froze for a second. Um, I'd like to call for a motion to approve the recommendations regarding the denial of an expulsion readmit request. It will be so a roll call. Second. Thank you. Mr. Forchina, as a vote? Aye. Ms. Cheris Espinoza? Aye. Dr. Martinez Salir? Aye. Mr. Madison? Aye. Mr. Perez? Aye. Ms. Singh Allen? Aye. And myself is unanimous. Thank you. Number five, public comment. Public comments of persons desiring to address the board about items not on the agenda. Public written comments that were submitted through the district's Google public comments form by 4.30 p.m. regarding items not on the board's agenda tonight will be read. Ms. Pinkerton? Yes, Madam Board President. There are uh, five public comments that I will, the, there, are, there are several, but there are five that I'll be reading um, and I'll stipulate the names and then um, if there are anonymous ones of the same uh, type of comment, then I will list how many anonymous ones there were submitted. The first comment is from Joshua Yang, and he reads, my children attend the Elk Grove Unified School District, and they are the third generation of Hmong Americans. I would like to comment that it is irresponsible for Bobby Singh Allen, an elected official, to state her opinion and broadcast that the Hmong clan system is a controlling and intimidating system used to attack and silence women. By the way, her statement is incorrect and she should not be the jury and the executor of a whole culture. Statement as the truth. Sadly, harm is done, but I am hoping that she will do the right thing and do her own research along with visiting Hmong events to see the culture firsthand. I'm also hoping that she does not she does retract that statement and apologize to the Hmong community. Hopefully afterward my children and many other Hmong children won't face much negative reactions from their peers at school. The next comment comes from V Garcia. My name is V Garcia. I'm a retired teacher who taught in Elk Grove. School board members have come and gone. I have read and heard enough of the news and social media to get an idea of what's happening. The Hmong are some of the most respectful and kind people you will ever have the privilege of coming across. They respect and love their elders because they know the sacrifice they have made in order to come to this country. Their children are respectful and well-behaved. It's rare that there are ever discipline issues with them. For trustees Nancy Charis Espinosa and Bobby Singh Allen to speak so ignorantly about embarrassing. You two do not deserve to sit on that board to oversee 63,000 students who are many of whom are mom. The third comment comes from Lee Xiong. Good evening members of the board. In my seven years as a Sheldon High School athletic, uh, athletics booster, I have not had the chance to meet and work with all of you. But with three children in the, EG, in, the, in the Elk Grove Unified School District, I do hope to have the opportunity eventually. I get that politics. Stand. Yes. You froze and I get that politics. Okay. I get that politics is ugly, but I cannot tolerate and will not stand idly by while someone trashes an entire culture simply for her own political gain. Without fully understanding the Hmong clan system, Bobby Singh Allen has recently made some racial generalizations about Hmong people. In describing her own alleged experience, she claims that the Hmong patriarchal clan system is a controlling and intimidating system used to her. She a system used to? Is a system controlling and intimidating used to attack and silence women. This is a direct quote from her. She received random messages from complete strangers, not only have her allegations been completely discredited, 
and case closed by Elk Grove PD. There is no chance she is patriarchal, patriarchally related to the still anonymous accused, and there is no indication that any clan system was used. That makes her claim categorically false in addition to being racist. If she has been harassed by unknown parties in her career, it's unfortunate, but that is no reason to make the additional stretch and accuse an entire culture. She has been unremorseful in her statements. In fact, in response to EGSD parents, she referred to her constituents as sheep while referring to herself as a lion. It concerns me that she sits on the Elk Grove Unified School District Board, making decisions that affect educational opportunities for our children. I respectfully request the board censure Trustee Singh Allen. Further, that the board produce a report of all board decisions Singh Allen took part of that directly or indirectly may have impacted, impacted opportunities for Hmong students. Make a determination if bias was a factor in those decisions. Uh, if possible. Thank you. Fourth comment comes from Ka Seong. Good evening board members. Recent events have unfolded that has compelled me to reach out to you. I thank you for this opportunity to voice my concerns as an Elk Grove resident, parent of Elk Grove students, and an American of Hmong descent. Without fully understanding the Hmong clan system, school board trustee Bobby Singh Allen has recently made some generalized statements about the Hmong people or Hmong clans. She has made polarizing statements and accusations about the use of Hmong clans, which has been circulating in several news articles and social media pages. Despite stating that she has respect for the Hmong community, she has shown no remorse for concerns that many Hmong citizens and others have voiced regarding her statements. She stands by her claim that the Hmong patriarchal clan system is a controlling and intimidating system used to attack and silence women. Trustee Singh Allen has opened the doors to more hate and division in the community, potentially causing harm to the Hmong community and our children. As a first generation Hmong woman, I have seen the positive changes in the Hmong culture the achievements, the shift in evolution over the very short years that we have settled here in the States. I'm insulted that an elected woman of color would make such a blanket statement without about another culture. Although we are growing in numbers, the Hmong people are still a small group. We have lost so much, overcome so much, and have achieved so much in a short time. We are not perfect, but we are not controlling, intimidating. We are not a controlling, intimidating system used to attack and silence women. We will not stand idly by as others stand, slander our culture for their personal gain. The most upsetting and disappointing thing about all of this is that it is part of a political game. Shortly after making several of these statements, Trustee Singh Allen, she's dragging the name of the Hmong people through the Ms. mud. Kirchen, it's shortly after making these allegations. Mm -hmm. Shortly after making several of these statements, Trustee Al Singh Allen announced her candidacy to run for Elk Grove mayor. She is dragging the name of the Hmong people through the mud to get a seat at the table. These statements from Trustee Singh Allen are a misrepresentation of who the Hmong people are and how we live. These are false statements. These are racist statements. If the board lets this behavior continue, the board is just as responsible for the statements. Therefore, Singh Allen. And the last comment I'll read on this particular um, area is from the Hmong excuse American. Me, excuse me, uh, I missed the last sentence. The sentence that starts with therefore, we just finished, missed. Yes. Therefore, I respectfully request that the board censor Trustee Singh Allen. Thank you. This last comment I'll read is from Hmong American Kinship. Uh, in a recent, this is addressing trustee Bobby Singh entitled Mayor's Associates Accused of Harassment, you were quoted as describing the Hmong clan system as a controlling and intimidating system used to attack and silence women. Without a comprehensive understanding of the Hmong culture, you have emboldened racial attacks against the Hmong community during a time when racial tensions have skyrocketed, skyrocketed and Asian Americans in particular are already experiencing a spike in hate crimes related to the global pandemic. 
You violated education codes 200 through 262.4 and 92 statement about the mock community. Sante, you froze um, after reading the codes. Those code of, so the codes 200 through 262.4 and also code 9271 in the code of ethics. When you made your statement about the Hmong community and continue to engage in social media where you encouraged and supported discriminatory and racially charged statements about the Hmong culture. This is unacceptable behavior and an elected official who serves in a position overseeing thousands of students, many of whom are Hmong. Due to the harmful impact of your words and actions, uh, due to the harmful impact your words and actions have had on the Hmong community here in Elk Grove and throughout the larger Sacramento region, it is clear that you have, blatant in a, have a blatant inability to create a safe and positive learning environment for the diverse students of the Elk Grove Unified School District. We no longer feel that our children are safe from discrimination while you remain a member of the school board. We hereby uh, demand that you, Bobby Singh Allen, is and undergo cultural sensitivity. Ms. Pinkerton, we missed what we were getting de demanded. We hereby demand that you, Bobby Singh Allen, issue a formal apology to the Hmong community and undergo cultural sensitiv sensitivity training or resign the, uh, your position as an Elk Grove Unified School District Board of Trustee, Board of Education Trustee. These there were comments that were similar in nature. There were approximately 34 anonymous comments submitted and of similar sentiment. There were also comments from David Famavong, Ferdos Sheik, Rail Leon Vanandi, Christy Xiong, and Susie Liu. I'll read additional comments. The different nature, Sim 5. The first comment is from Surinder Garial. My grandchildren had been attending Anna Kirchgater Elementary School and Bobby has been instrumental. She's a champion. And, and, excuse me. And Bobby has been instrumental is where you cut out. Just so everybody knows we have um, technical help hopefully arriving from Ms. Pinkerton as soon as possible. Thank you. And Bobby has been instrumental as a board member and also in the Elk Grove community. She's a champion for the students and she has a huge heart. She always wants to keep the elderly people in the community like ourselves and she is very respectful of all cultures and people. Bobby has been a victim of slander and does not deserve that type of treatment from anybody. Moreover, the current mayor of Elk Grove, Bobby is an outstanding citizen and a great example for the Elk Grove community. The next comment is from Glenna Sansoni. I publicly support Bobby Singh Allen. I have known her for many years as a woman of integrity and as a citizen devoted to the betterment of Elk Grove. My entire family has gone, has strong ties to Elk Grove. Both my husband and I grew up in Elk Grove and graduated from Elk Grove High School. When it was our only high school, my husband's entire teaching and counseling career was spent. Continued to be deeply. Ms. Pinkerton was spent. You cut out it was spent. Mm -hmm. My husband's entire teaching and counseling career was spent in the Elk Grove Unified School District. We continue to be deeply committed to Elk Grove with our volunteer time and financial donations to the Community Foundation Scholarship Program. We have watched Elk Grove grow from a tiny rural community to a thriving diverse city. That success has come through the tireless work up to provide support to the Rotary Club, to the Food Bank, and most importantly, to the school board where she has served as a trustee for eight years. In everything Bobby does, she demonstrates the dedication, the dedication and sensibility she brings to her role, to her first role, that of a mother. She listens with her heart and has used her guiding principles of collaboration and advocacy to recognize and enhance the opportunities of the diverse students in our district. I have known many Elk Grove public servants over the years 
very Bobby Singh Allen. The next comment comes from Davinder Sufi. I would like to talk about Ward Pinkerton. I'm sorry, I didn't realize I was on mute. We lost you in the last one. I've known it is many. Do I mute? Do I mute? Do I mute? Yeah. <laughs> We're going to a phone line, so this should be better shortly. Ms. Pinkerton, if you can pick up on the last one at I've known many. What I've got. Give her one minute. We're trying to we're trying to switch over to a different line. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. This next comment comes from Davinder Sufi. We lost the end of the last comment. End of the last comment. It was the at I've known. Okay. I have known many Elk Grove public servants. Over the years, very few have been as selfless and admirable as Bobby Singh Allen. Thank you. This next comment comes from Davinder Sufi. I would like to talk about board trustee Bobby Singh Allen when I moved, uh, Bobby Singh Allen. When I moved from Natomas to Elk Grove five years ago, I took my children out of private school and took a leap of faith by placing them at Anna Kirchgater Elementary School per Bobby's advice. My son had been diagnosed with ADHD and autism, and Bobby supported and encouraged me that he would thrive at the school because of her resources the school district had to offer. Not only did he do well, but he improved with his socialization and became a much happier child. My daughter thrived as well. Bobby has helped a lot of families this way by supporting them. I have known Bobby Singh Allen for the past 20 years, and I can tell you that if anyone needed any help in any way, School related or not, she is the kind of individual that would go the extra mile for anyone. As an immigrant, Bobby understands and can empathize with others regardless of their culture, age, race, sexual orientation, etc. She knows the difficulties that many people face when moving to America and in trying to assimilate within the different cultures. I am deeply disturbed reading about Steve Lee's behavior in the community. We absolutely cannot tolerate his actions. He has threatened people in the community and has made slanderous accusations that are simply not true. I will not sit by and watch Bobby be berated by this individual. Bobby Singh Allen is a very well-respected individual in the Sikh community. I will not sit by and watch Bobby be berated. Oh, sorry. Singh stands for lion, and Bobby is known as a Sharni, Punjabi for a lion, and rightfully so. She defends and protects others, and she is a valuable member of the community. She is a trusted member of the board and a valuable member of society. The next comment is from Paul Lindsay. My name is Paul Lindsay and I've been a resident of Elk Row for 35 years. I've known Missing Allen for many years and I have found her to be a champion for all those she has represented, regardless of race, creed, ethnicity, orientation, or background. You have known Ms. Singh Allen since her original appointment to the board in 2012, and you must have a deep and abiding sense of her integrity, her commitment to fairness and equality, and her dedication to making Elk Grove schools a better place to learn. More importantly, you have also learned for, of her belief that the values of diversity and inclusion must be included in each student's education. You will receive comments from individuals tonight calling for Ms. Singh Allen's resignation from the board. These comments are generally simply in retaliation for speaking out against Mayor Lee and his supporters for a pattern of harassment, intimidation, and bullying. Mayor Lee chose not to take responsibility for his own actions, but chose to deflect the issues by claiming it was an attack on the Hmong culture. Members of the city council and former mayor Gary, Gary Davis have all stood with Ms. Singh Allen on the issue and will be considering a censure measure against Mayor Lee later this week. You will also learn that a petition will be presented to Mr. Lee at the next city council meeting asking that he resign because of a long-standing pattern of political abuse, harassment, intimidation, and bullying that he and his supporters have waged against minority women 
political opponents. As of this morning, that petition has gathered 6,898 signatures. I proudly support Ms. Singh Allen as a board member, and I am proud to use my own name in doing so. Look into your own hearts. You know Bobby Singh Allen. You know that she is a passionate advocate for those she serves. The children of the district, their parents, teachers, district staff, and the general public. You know that she is also a passionate advocate for diversity and inclusion. I strongly urge you not to bow to anonymous attacks or any other comments that bend the truth. And this comment is from Mary Deutsch. Hello, Elk Grove Unified Trustees. As trustees, you must all engage and adopt policy, not only in the global fields of education, but also embrace societal concerns regarding racism or issues in schools that may pour out to our communities involving bias, or teaching that is not culturally responsive or sustaining. While involved in my former leadership roles, I have worked with this entire Elk Grove Unified School Board in one-on-one -on -one conversations and in large and small committees. But I would like to recognize one trustee who deserves kudos for uh, as an arbiter of our richly diverse student population, Bobby Singh Allen. In the eight years I have known Bobby, she has always held a ready-to-go action attitude to objectively identify and speak for our multicultural communities. If I needed someone to come and speak to an EL class at my school, Bobby came every time, promoting all students, sparks of ideas, goals, addressing challenges toward learning while making everyone feel welcome to, to opportunity without abandonment of their culture. If there was an at-risk student that needed to be heard, Bobby would ask if she would, could meet and to listen. If there was a racial or social, societal matter to be seen, Bobby would never attend in silence when unity was needed. I would like to say that Bobby Singh Allen is a great compliment to this board, schools, students, all staff, and our community with her words and actions challenging your integrity and commitment. Thank you, Bobby. Marie Deutsch, past president, CSEA 831, retired EGUSD employee. In support or in similar vein, there were comments submitted by Sherry Wilson, Linda Vu, the Jarkin, uh, Jarkin family, Monica Patel, Dr. Jacqueline Jack Jung, Jake Rambo, Mike Manganon, Samuel Sodergren, Jeffrey Adam, Baldir Garial, Sanvi Singh, Jamie C, Randy Becker, Jillian Hain, Bushra Bashir, Suhail Chowdhury, and Mr. or Ms. Velasquez, and Samuel Thurgan. And there were also 20 anonymous submissions, also of a similar um, sort. In some general public comments, this one is anonymous, and this is relating to something uh, relating to training of some sort. I have seen slides with Elko Unified School District letterhead that appears to be used for some type of training. Clarification is demanded as it appears that you are absolving yourself and all employees from an injury inflicted on a child or student in your care while in attendance at school. You need to clarify as this broad and unacceptable um, manner is, is stated. Um, in a similar vein, Oh, that was it. Another anonymous. Um, I just received a phone call today, two days before the first day of school, about my Head Start preschooler. She is three and expected to be online for three hours, and they aren't providing Chromebooks. Her doctor doesn't agree with that much screen time. Please explain. And there's one more comment. Preschool Head Start, 
All my kids went. I was on a parent meeting team, and this past year and this year are bad. No notes to tell us what's happening. They change our meetings and don't tell us. We show up, and nobody's there. Now with the COVID uh, situation, there's no letter or you call, and nobody knows what's going on. She's supposed to call for next week when school starts, and nobody has called me. It's very sad um, for kids if they don't care. The following comments are from Student Equity Council. There are two from Student Equity Council, and they are identical. Uh, but they read, please note, this comment addresses different demands than the one submitted by the Student Equity Council prior. Please read the entirety of both comments as opposed to combining every, the other one. We, the students of the Black Student Union, demand the following actions be taken to remedy the problem of disproportionate disciplinary action being taken against Black students. Hiring, number one, hiring instructional coaches that solely focus on equity for each site. Number two, the repurposing and transparency of the role of SRO slash law enforcement by teaching students their rights, building a mutual understanding of expectations, and ensuing, uh, ensuring no physical and emotional harm to students is caused. The ultimate goal is to eliminate the need for law enforcement on campuses. Three, increased transparency for the grievance protocol without retaliation for students when a staff member or SRO commits harmful and or racist actions. Four, mandatory de-escalation training and restorative practices for teachers and a student survey that assesses the success of such training. Five, the designation of safe, practice, safe spaces for black and POC students to receive support and that they are uh, not simultaneously used as a disciplinary area. Six, a transparent log that records the frequency of teachers sending students out of their classes. Teachers frequently send, sending students outside should be educated and coached on restorative practices. Seven, professional expectations of teachers explicitly communicated to students so that there is a mutual understanding of appropriate behavior for a teacher. And then as an eighth one that was also added, uh, counselors should be trained on appropriately assessing students for special ed support and not as a way to implement biases. And also make sure that curriculum should be meaningful, relevant, and helpful in today's society. And these are the last public comments. There's approximately six of them, but they're not long. This comment is from Jamil Brown. I'm concerned about the district's definition of what is not child abuse. I am concerned because I have a black student and this district disproportionately disciplines black students. My student is not safe the way the district perceives and acts towards black students. It is apparent in the testimonies of many black students and families who have spoken out about their experiences in the district. And this district continues to allow this type of behavior to continue with these racist and overreaching policies and procedures. I demand the board reflect the needs of students and not continue with the historical attitude the district has taken against black students. Remove this from the policies, practices, and procedures immediately. This will not uh, be my student. And the next comment comes from Thorntona Kishon, Kishon Thorntona. As a black, as a parent of a black sixth grade boy, a member of the Concerned African American Parents Organization and a black student union advisor, I am concerned with the district's definition of or explanation of what is not child abuse and what actions give immunity to those that may violate our black students' civil rights. I'm concerned because of the district's inability to properly treat black students respectfully. This type of description allows for the continued institutionalized racism that has been part of the district for years. Our students and families have shared their stories and concerns for years, and nothing has happened to protect our black students. I demand to commit to protecting the black students in this district by destroying this type of description and find an equitable way to respond to our students, to our students' needs. Okay. 
and this also comes from this is from Keyshawn Turner. As someone who works within the EGUSD and works directly with youth of color, the idea that you are still allowing police officers and peace officers in the schools is not only disheartening but crazy. Given that we are in the middle of a pandemic and you all have time to think about the severity of this issue, I urge that you all make the right decision and remove the officers from the schools. They are of no help. They are at best reactionary rather than preventive. They provide little to no safety to students, especially to students of color. This idea is not radical. It's necessary. Remove the officers now. The idea that you want to give these same people qualified immunity after harming students as helpful is fast out, disgraceful, disgusting. Take a long look in the mirror and ask yourself, do you really care about these students? Do you really care? Because these children live in fear and these officers rather um, of these officers rather than feeling safe. If school is supposed to be so safe, why do you allow these officers to stay? You shouldn't uh, be on the right side of history or the blood will be on your hands when this is all over and kids do return to campus. Don't even think about doing so until there is a cure for COVID or else that's even more blood on your hands. Have some sense. This next comment comes from Jamil Brown. I'm concerned about the district's definition of what is not child abuse. I'm concerned because I have a black student and this district is proportionally disciplined black students. My student is not safe with the way um, the district perceives the acts towards black students, it is apparent in the testimonies of many black students and families who have spoken out about their experiences in the district and this district continues to allow this type of behavior to continue with these racist and overreaching policies and procedures. I demand the board reflect the needs of the students and not continue with the historical attitude of the district has taken against black students. Remove this policies, practices, and procedures immediately. This will not be my student. Um, two more. Four more. Um, this one is from Julius McIntyre. Why does the board feel it is necessary to pass policies that will excuse district school officer, et cetera, from being liable for excessive force? Uh, there are already protections in the ed code. Why expand them? Too many kids of color being brutalized by Oak Grove Unified School District, including myself 20 years ago. This is unnecessary and dangerous. Uh, one anonymous one. Two questions that must be answered. What is being done to show that black lives matter in every way in every one of your schools? What long-term anti-racist professional development will you provide and implement for all faculty and staff? One more anonymous one. Board trustees, please consider amending the language that has recently surfaced on the EGUSD website in regards to child abuse. The language presented here has an underlying tone of protecting racist and biased actions at the hands of student resource officers. While the entire statement is concerning the line injury by a peace officer within the course and scope of his or her employment is particularly troubling. As we have seen in recent news and brought to light by scholars such as Candy X. Ibrahim, systemic racism is deeply embedded in all of our policies. To protect officers within the scope of their employment needs to be revisited so it needs to be revisited because upholding these policies continues to oppress black children. As a member of this community, I'm calling for the revision of the language as well as the removal of SROs in our school. And the last public comment is from Lorraine Pryor. Good evening, school board, superintendent Hoffman and Ms. Avalos. I miss being in front in, I miss being in front of you to convey my displeasure in action. I find harmful to the black community. I am and consistently perplexed by the tone deafness in which you carry out victimizing children while you claim to care about them. Sunday night, I received screenshots in my Facebook inbox of your mandated reporter training. I specifically call your attention to page 42 of 88. If you think bullets two through four two through four are going to fly, I need you to understand it is a non-starter. The black community cannot, the black community cannot truth this district due to the bias enforcement of other policies to equitable discharge, is to equitably discharge its duties. Mr. Hoffman, you cannot believe black lives to matter and then train your staff on this detrimental policy 
while maintaining your status in the state as number three or number five district or number three district in disproportionate discipline of black boys. Shame on you. Before you quite before you quote Ed Code 49001 to me, let me assure you that I have read it and you have left out in self-defense or in order to remove a weapon. Although I have made the decision to pull my daughter out of the public school system, if you think that I'm going away, rest assured, you have just picked your first fight of the new school year. I look forward to addressing my concerns directly when time permits. And board member, board president, Ms. Albiani, that ends the public comment. Thank you. Appro appropriate district staff can follow up with concerns with um, issues presented at public comment. I'd like to move on to the consent agenda. Ms. Pinkerton, is there any public comment on the consent agenda? Uh, Board President Albiani, there are no comments on the consent agenda. Okay. Thank you. Then we will call for a motion and a second to approve items 1 through 16 on the consent agenda. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. I will we'll call for a roll call vote. Ms. Singh Allen? Aye. Mr. Perez? Aye. Mr. Madison? Aye. Dr. Martinez Salir? Aye. Ms. Cheris Espinosa? Aye. Mr. Fortina? Aye. And myself. It is unanimous. The consent agenda passes. We will. Go down to agenda item number 11. How many units have they submitted any public comment for tonight? Board President Albiani, there are no public comments from the bargaining unit. Thank you. Then we will move on to reports. Item number 12. We have one report on the learning continuity and attendance plan. Mr. Cerruti. We will have Mr. Shruti present, then we will hear if there's any public comment, and then we will have board comments. Question. Oh, are people seeing the PowerPoint on your screens? Great. Yes. Thank you, and good evening uh, to the entire board, Superintendent Hoffman, Ms. Avalos, and good evening also to our community members who are joining us this evening. Appreciate the opportunity to provide an overview of what the uh, learning continuity and attendance plan is. Bear with me, I'm trying to move the PowerPoint forward. There we go. Um, the presentation is set up um, along our typical pattern of explaining our business, which is why, how, and what. Um, why we have the learning continuity and attendance plan, how it's being developed, and specifically what's in the plan, the components of the plan. And uh, I'm, this is a, a tag team this evening. I'm joined by our chief financial officer, Ms. Shannon Hayes. She'll be walking you through some budget information and then I will finish up with the timeline. Uh, specifically, why do we have it? It's, it's a needed programmatic and budgetary response to the COVID pandemic, obviously utilizing uh, public funds that we, sh we should be both uh, have accountability systems, meaning how, meaning how we're tracking and keeping track of things. And likewise, we should be responsible for the results of the need of, of the use of those funds. Uh, Senate Bill 98 uh, is what lays all of this out. And I do want to just take a moment and distinguish it from the local control and accountability plan. I find it interesting. I don't know if it was intentional, um, but I do find it a bit interesting that learning continuity and attendance plan also spells out LCAP. And so it has, I believe, created a bit of confusion in terms of, of what it is and what it isn't. It is very different from the local control and accountability plan. And in fact, Senate Bill 98, we will not be doing what we refer to um, uh, an accountability, the local control and accountability plan, we will not be creating one for the 2021 school year. Uh, and the learning continuity and attendance plan is the alternative to that. 
how it's being developed. Uh, the states laid out, sta it, it's similar to uh, the LCAP uh, in that there are stakeholder engagement requirements. When I move, conclude the presentation with the timeline, you'll see a, a significant difference is uh, the timeline. Mr. Yes, ma'am. Unfortunately, we lost you, so you'll see a significant. Thank you, and, and apologies for that. You'll see a significant difference in, in the timelines. Um, the LCAP, because we've been doing it for several years, is really a 12-month process. Um, and this is a several week process um, in terms of what we're doing. I share that not as an excuse. Um, we will do a, an exceptional job engaging our stakeholders. We'll in, be engaging our district advisory committee and our district English learner advisory committees. Those are the two committees similar to the LCAP itself, but specific to the uh, learning continuity and attendance plan, our requirements to engage those two committees. We've sent, we began to send surveys out last week and I realize our families are perhaps uh, experiencing some um, back that we're getting because their feedback Mr. is- Rudy, uh, we lost you. We sent surveys last week. Thank you. We sent surveys last week and um, the surveys will be running uh, through this week and we will gauge and potentially next week as well. Um, we'll be working with the Board of Education um, next week at the board workshop to engage uh, our board in their input and interests. We'll be posting the draft uh, on our district's website. Like I said, at the conclusion of this, I'll be pointing out the specific timeline for these various aspects of its development and adoption. And then there are eight basic elements within the plan. Um, the first is talking about how we're going to be measuring student participation and academic prog progress through synchronous instruction. And just to ensure for, for all, synchronous means real time. This is specific to distance learning. And this is what's being referred to when our teachers are working so how Mr. Shruti, we've lost you again. I'd like to take um, a, a three or four minute break. Do we have, um, do you see Steve in your office? Has he arrived yet? He has not, but I, I'm taking it. He's on his way. He is on your way. He will be bringing you a phone so we don't continue to do this. If we, um, I apologize, but I think it's better to take a five minute technical break than to continue interrupting everybody. Thank you, ma'am.
Why don't you for just a second? The Lord knows what I can do. All the phones muted. Testing one, two. Can anybody hear me? We got you, Mark. Great. Healing. And some yoga breaks. Tremaine. Nancy, you say you're doing yoga? I said we need to schedule in some yoga breaks. I agree. Stretches. I I'm inhaling my, food. I have my soundscape music behind me. So are we are, are we on live still? Like if I unclick, can I be seen eating? I think we're still recording. Yeah, we're definitely recording. All right. I'll stay off camera so you don't see my mouth moving, eating food. Thank you very much. I apologize for the interruption. Mr. Shruti, do you feel you're ready? I believe I am, and I'm just testing. So one, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. And two, are you seeing the PowerPoint on your screen? I do, and let me just check. I have Miss Singh Allen I can see. Um, oh, not my friend right now. Okay, I've got Mr. Forchina, Ms. Chairs Espinoza. Dr. Martin Soler, Ms. Singh Allen, Mr. Perez, can we get you back? And I have Mr. Madison and Mr. Perez. Thank you, all board members are back. Um, please go ahead, Mr. Rudy, thank you. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I'll just begin back up at the first bullet point um, to move through. Again, there are eight basic elements to, uh, to the plan. The first is, is measuring student participation and academic progress, again, through the synchronous instruction, the distance, this is real-time distance learning between the teacher and the students. How we'll address learning loss uh, through, and begin, that, that goes back to 2019. So a portion of this, an aspect of this plan also is talking about what we did from March 1st moving forward to today and moving forward Next, in, into the coming year, and that does include, um, obviously we're under distance learning conditions currently, but we do have to build into the plan uh, our approach to uh, bringing students back into school as well. A uh, third aspect is how we'll conduct, conduct outreach to students uh, who may be struggling and engaging or we're seeing uh, frequent absenteeism with those students, what strategies we'll be using to work with the families and those students. What type of additional support, so beyond the regular teacher and classroom instruction, uh, what type of supports will we be providing, um, and in particular, uh, accelerating the progress for our English learners, foster youth, homeless students, and our low income students? Yeah. 
and I'm trying to move this forward. There we go. Um, the fifth component of it is professional learning and development and additional resources for our teachers and educators. And that includes our paraeducators and uh, related service providers, occupational therapists, physical therapists, speech and language pathologists, our psychologists, all of our folks who are working and our staff who are working with our kids. How are we continuing to train and develop them and provide the resources they need to be successful with our students under uh, distance learning conditions, as well as um, we'll continue that when our students are coming back, to in, back into our schools. Food and nutritional services, how we will continue to provide meals for, uh, for both uh, distance learning, but also this is specific to in-person instruction. So when students begin to come back, that transitional model, when we have some students in school and some at home, uh, how will we be providing uh, food nutritional services during that time? And then the last two are budgetary. And the first one is looking at the alignment of our, our, of our funding sources with uh, student needs. So that's really making sure that we're conducting a needs analysis and then being able to go back and looking at the plan to utilize those funds and ensuring that there is an alignment between our needs that have been identified and the utilization of those fiscal resources. And then how state and federal funds um, within the continuity plan, as well as supplement, supplemental concentration grants, federal funds, how all of those are gonna be used together. And it gets into uh, ensuring that we're meeting our disproportionality requirements. Uh, I realize that may be a bit confusing to, to folks. Um, Ms. Hayes will be walking through a bit of this um, following this slide. I'm going to turn it over to her. But this is really, this is, uh, this is all the mathematics and, and the behind our funding source and simply making sure that we're continuing to use those dollars as they were intended and in the amounts that we are required to be using them in. And so with that, I'll be joined by uh, Ms. Shannon Hayes, our Chief Financial Officer, who will walk you through some of the budgetary components of the plan. Can everybody hear me okay? Um, so as far as the budget's concerned, um, through the CARES Act, we have received $58 million in one-time funds. The funds themselves come from um, four different funding sources from the state. The first one being Elementary and Secondary School Relief Act. The next one would be the Governor's Emergency Education Relief Fund, the Corona Relief, Coronavirus Relief Fund, and then the State General Fund. Of those four funding streams from the state, they have been allocated to districts in three specific groups. One being under SB 117, it's called the COVID-19 Response Fund. Those were actually um, distributed to districts, um, I wanna say either April or May. Um, so we've had access to those funds and there are very specific guidelines that goes with those. The second piece is the Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief, ESSER funds as I referred to. And those funds we knew about when um, I want to say as we were adopting, when we got into May Revise, we knew about those funds that were coming. And then the last component is the Learning Loss Mitigation Fund. Mark, if you could go to the next slide. So the use of funds under the SB 117, the COVID Response Fund. Put in that information. The Welcome to Zoom. Enter your meeting ID followed by pound. We're getting a lot of feedback someplace. Everybody mute except for Ms. Hayes, please. I don't have Ms. Pinkerton muted. Enter your participant ID followed by pound. You have entered the meeting as a panelist. Attendees can now hear you speak. This meeting is being recorded. So for the SB 117 COVID-19 response funds, it was, we have a little bit over a million dollars at our uh, disposal, but it was very specific to these four things. So costs associated with maintaining nutrition services, cleaning and disinfecting facilities, um, personal protective equipment or PPE as that's referred to, and then materials necessary to provide opportunities for distance learning. 
So because those fundings were released to us um, in last school year, um, we have tapped some of these funds specifically um, more towards the PPE and the Zoom services and the other um, software needs and um, device needs. We go to the next slide, Mark. Then looking at the ESSER funds, it starts to become a little bit more um, open, if you will, but restricted in the same type of way. Um, these funds are specific to, um, let me back up. These funds were allocated to the districts based on your percentage of Title I money that you receive. These funds are also um, subject to private school participation, so it feels like the same types of restrictions that we see with Title I money. So coordination and preparedness and response efforts, um, providing principals and school leaders with resources, addressing the needs, and it, it, it's back to um, these are the same um, groups of children that we see in our district LCAP as well as with Title I, so addressing needs of low-income children, children with disabilities, English learners, minorities, and homelessness, and foster care, and then developing and implementing procedures and systems to improve preparedness, and then planning for and coordinating um, for long-term closures. Thank you. And then here's some more. Staff training and professional development but that's specific to sanitation and minimizing the spread of infectious disease, purchasing supplies to sanitize and clean. So like we saw before under the SB 117, education technology, that was a big component that um, we tapped into, mental health services and support, summer learning and supplemental after school programs, including providing instruction or online learning during the summer months. This is difficult for Elk Grove because summer came and went and then this money came out with its regula regulations. So the positive about this money is it does not expire in December, like some of our other funds that we received at the 58 million. So this, at least we have some time that we could do a summer program. We could do um, a longer day type program, um, anything to help with children to increase their, um, their learning time and then other activities that are necessary to continue the employment of existing staff. So part of SB 98, it states that you cannot terminate an employee without cause, and the three groups that they point out are custodial, transportation, and um, food nutrition services. So we don't have that situation. Um, I think we've been in a place where our employees are um, being utilized as we find things for them to do. Like I know with transportation, they've been doing trainings and some other things. So um, they have, we can terminate somebody, but it has to be um, for cause, not for lack of funds, because we did receive these funds. And Mark, you go to the next one, thank you. So learning loss mitigation, this is the big one. Um, we have approximately, um, I wanna say it's in the neighborhood of $50 million to spend towards learning loss mitigation. So this is the monies that are tied directly to the, um, the new plan that Mark was referring to. So by September 30th, um, after we have stakeholder engagement and we bring you back the plan, um, the board will be asked to actually adopt the plan no later than September 30th of 2020. The funds are to support TK through 12th grade pupil academic achievement. Um, addressing learning loss or accelerating progress using learning supports that begin before the start of school. Again, this is problematic because they're asking for a plan but telling you you can use it in the past. So um, this one's a little bit tricky and we're still trying to untangle. Um, extending the instructional school year by increasing instructional minutes or taking other action that increases the amount of instructional time or service. So with the learning loss mitigation funds, uh, currently this funding terminates December 30th. So a very, very short window to expend quite a large amount of money. Um, the district can go ahead and identify those services that were given to students over the summer. It can also utilize this money for expenditures that happened starting in March. Um, but again, it has to be in the learning loss mitigation area, so it has to be something directly impacting a student's learning. So we've been doing an, a, a, all kinds of different um, 
reaching out to different school sites and different stakeholders to find out is there something that um, is needed that's new, is there something that we have been doing that we're not aware of that can be applied to these funds. These funds were actually um, released to um, districts in the last couple weeks. I want to say it was right around August 1st. So not even knowing, we had estimates of what we thought we might receive, but not even knowing what the um, total value of the money is received and then the tight timeline is, is a little bit problematic. And I'm rambling and I apologize. Mark, if you could go to the next slide. Um, these are additional um, uses, providing additional academic service. We talked about that, such as assessments, intensive instruction to address gaps. Um, instructional materials or supports or devices for connectivity, providing um, integrated people supports to address barriers to learning, such as health, counseling, mental health services, professional development, to assist teachers and parents um, with distance learning, and then access to school breakfast and lunch programs. So that last bullet there, those are things that the district, I think, has been actively reaching out to parents in our community and trying to address as we started um, at school and at distance learning environment. I'll turn it back over to Mark. Thank you very much, Shannon. And just confirming folks can hear me? Yes. Thank you, Chris. Um, walking through the walking through the timeline for folks, um, we have the, this evening's board meeting, board workshop next week. Um, I have had, uh, we've received a few uh, emails because they have seen this and we're, I want to confirm that this is a regular board meeting. It is, uh, it'll be a Zoom meeting and open to the public for those that want to uh, sit in on that meeting as well. Um, a draft, post, a draft uh, plan posted on the website for public comment. We're targeting, targeting September 7th through the 11th is when that would be posted. If we can get it up sooner, we will. Um, as Shannon indicated, and not making excuses, this, but this is a, it is a very tight timeline in which to uh, put a comprehensive and thoughtful plan together. But we will uh, meet the timeline. Our public hearing is on September 15th, uh, and then we have our DAC and DLAC meetings. Um, that's our District Advisory Committee and District English Learner Advisory Committee meeting on the 17th. And I do want to point out. Um, it's a requirement to have these separate meetings, and while they are on the same date, they are separate meetings, but our, uh, our DAC and DLAC do some great combined work. So what we will do is have two separate meetings, and then the plan is to bring them together as a large group so that they can hear what each other uh, was talking about and ideas that they generated. And then the adoption is at a, um, a board meeting, an additional board meeting in August that was scheduled the 28th and that too um, will be available to anyone who's interested to attend um, through Zoom. And uh, just a quick comment um, regarding uh, the stakeholder engagement because it is crucial. Uh, and I never say that, uh, I, I'll never say that we're perfect, but we've taken, um, I think, very substantial efforts over the past several years with our LCAP to engage our, our stakeholders to the tune of tens of thousands of individual respondents. Um, I shared with you what the requirements are, for example, through our DAC and DLAC, but we are looking to reach out to our community advisory committee, which is our special ed parent group. Um, and you've heard some comments that have been shared by uh, rep student representatives, uh, representatives of our uh, student equity council. We'll be reaching out to that group as well. So we are taking some additional steps over the next couple of weeks to uh, also secure feedback from a, as broad a uh, stakeholder base as possible. And with that, um, I will, uh, Ms. Hayes and I are happy to answer any questions that any board members may have. Thank you. Thank you. We'll start with, uh, is there any public comment on this item, Ms. Pinkerton? President Albiani, there are two comments. Thank you. The first comment comes from Mende, uh, Mary Mendez Lee. It is our understanding that the LCAP local control accounti accountability plan process is suspended this year, and there is a learning continuity and attendance plan temporarily in its place. 
student members of the Laguna Creek High School Student Equity Council and Black Student Union, as well as the Kasumas Oak Student Equity Council and several student equity councils and Black Student Union advisors across the district, want to make it clear that equity and racial justice must be a priority. In fact, this being a pandemic year makes racial justice even more salient, an even more salient issue as black families and families of color are being disproportionately affected by COVID-19. The learning continuity and attendance plan must be drafted and adopted through a lens of equity and any accountability and decision-making process supported by the board should specifically focus on participation of outreach to and learning loss of our black students and students of color. Finally, we leave you with a question that we hope you will answer both today in words and ultimately through your actions. What will the board commit to in terms of accountability and action to ensure that black students and students of color are a priority and are treated equitably. Sincerely, Bridget Kemp Bell from Valley High School, Mary Mendez Lee, Laguna Creek High School, Haley Marez, Florin High School, Diana Brooks, Laguna Creek High School, Nicole Cecil, Sheldon High School, Lisa Munson, Casunas Oaks High School, Elena San Diego, Laguna Creek High School, Trina Lee, Elk Grove High School, Natasha Lewis Jones, Franklin High School, Ishan Thorntona, BSU and EAAP, and the students of the Casumas Oaks High School Student Equity Council and Laguna Creek High School Student Equity Council and Black Student Union. The second comment is from Judy Tang. With regards to the plan, there are some missing items that need to be additionally addressed. What is the selection process for the committee to help with the creation of the plan and if parental, teacher, and school administration will also be a part of it? A group of district employees who aren't in daily and direct communication should not be the only people in part of addressing the unique challenges. Additionally, the use of ES SER amidst any purchasing mention of technology for teachers. I know firsthand that teachers are not technologically well equipped to do their jobs and must rely on personal equipment, borrowing and or the use of outdated technology that inhibits actual learning between teachers and students. Those are the only two comments, Board President Albiani. Thank you. Now, um, we'll go through any comments or questions from our board. Ms. St. Allen? Thank you. A um, couple of questions and some comments. It, it's my understanding that Cal OES was, is, was providing PPE. Is that, is that true or for school districts? I, I've read that a few times to help cut some of these costs that we're supposedly responsible for. Does anyone know about that? Rob, you want to speak to it um, or I can? You're muted right Rob, now. Rob, you need to unmute, please. And it's not working. I got it. So we, so we actually received um, stuff through OES. We also uh, worked through the governor's office, did send um, a significant amount of uh, PPE through the county offices of ed that have been delivered to local districts. So we, we procured um, a significant amount on our own, uh, but we also have the, uh, the additional uh, supplies that we received um, through, the, uh, through the state. I believe the state's idea was it was two to three months worth of supplies. And, um, and that was uh, with the idea that we were fully back. Uh, so we have plenty of supplies on hand right now. Um, but as we move forward to uh, the transitional model and ultimately full back without a, uh, if a uh, vaccine isn't in place, additional uh, PPE will need to be procured. Very good. Um, 
on learning loss mitigation, page 12. Just for me, like the, the learning loss mitigation is, is very important. And I think it's some of the comments also suggested um, in terms of equity. Um, slide 12, I think it's the one right before that. The second bullet, um, I'm encouraged to see the focus here as it relates to um, social and emotional learning, mental health services and professional development. But in all of this, um, I know that we look at everything through that equity lens, but the learning loss of our highest need students is different than our just our standard, you know, our student population. So I, I believe some of the comment, public comments uh, were related to that, um, particularly as it deals with our um, African American students, our so our um, special needs students, English language learners, and all of those. Are we going to focus, apart from our general plan here, more specific to our highest need students, or will we be looking at that really more closely? to really look at it from an equity lens to make sure that our highest need students have what they need to be successful. Bobby, the strategy, the, the strategy that we're taking, um, so the short answer to that is yes. Um, we're, an incredible amount of work has been done, very targeted work with, with respect to um, ensuring that we're providing the, the very best possible services to our special education students. And I'm not going to pretend that it's not a challenge. It is, it is a, it's a very real challenge. Um, we've had a specific focus on uh, the strategies we're taking with our, with our English learner population. Uh, and in terms of the, the equity lens, um, there, was a, there was a reason that the person who uh, was at the, at the center of planning, who was actually the project manager, when we were looking at developing the model moving forward. Um, and I've shared pre previous board meetings, uh, the work of tactical teams um, and specialized operational teams, the way that we broke this challenge down. And the person who was coordinating that work and act served as the project manager was uh, Matt Espinoza, who is the administrator over our Office of Educational Equity. So there's been considerable work done. The lens is uh, on equity, ensuring that our neediest, of, uh, neediest students and those that have uh, traditionally been underserved, that there is a specific focus on how we're going to make sure that we're meeting the needs of those students. In terms of stakeholder en engagement and the diversity of mindsets, Will we be expanding the, the stakeholder engagement to other, other subgroups? Well, we're going to, so the strategies that we've used is, um, and, and we're casting as broad a net as possible. And the thing that I just want to point out, um, and again, this isn't excuses, we're, we are going to be, as I indicated, you heard some comments from our students um, that are actively engaged and active members of our um, district student equity council. And Matt Espinoza and John Dixon, um, John is one of our secondary school directors. The two of them work with that team and they're going to be working with our student equity council members so that their voice is ensured and that's covering our, our across our district. Um, the surveys that we are sending out, we're getting, I, we will have, I'll be able to share with the board. We're gonna pull data at the end of this week, share with the board what we have as of uh, at the, the workshop on Wednesday. And we will continue to see and continue to cast a net. I, I wanna share with everyone, we have to make decisions and have to have a plan done by about September 1st. We have to have a draft completed. So we will continue to make every effort that we possibly can. And that does include the sooner we can get the, um, uh, a draft posted, that also will enable uh, community members to be able to provide comment to a completed draft as well. That's all I have for now. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Forshina. 
Thank you. You caught me off guard. I was waiting to be last. I know. I, I messed up on my deal, and I was. That's going not to a problem. So, okay. We're back. Um, Mark. At this point in time, have you identified the metrics that are proposed for use? The metrics meaning, when you say metrics, I just want to make sure I'm, I'm tracking with you, Carmen. Metrics measuring student outcome? Um, bullet one, bullet two, and that first set of comments. Keep going. Yep. Yep. So the metrics that we use, we're, we're, we are in the process. So a couple of things. First of all, one, the, uh, the first was at the beginning of the school year, what we want to do is, is diagnostics. So that's assessing how students, the, the current status of where students are. Um, we have a system called Illuminate that is a, uh, an assessment, an online assessment system. We'll be utilizing the resources of Illuminate, working directly with our teachers to develop, um, and there's been work that has been done um, related to the development of, of assessments. And so we will have assessments in place um, and utilized that will be able to measure student progress. Speaking of uh, Illuminate and additionally Ingenuity, uh, before all this stuff started happening, we were expecting reports on both of those uh, in terms of uh, their utilization within the, in the district and the success we've had with them. Is that going to come at some point in time? I know that's a different topic, but. Uh, in terms of providing updates to the board respect or related to Illuminate and Ingenuity, we the board requests that we can certainly do that. Well, I, I just remember conversations yeah. saying that was going to happen. Oh, Carmen, I took note. I'll follow up on that. Okay. Um, with respect to um, bullet three, that's I'll just that's a comment. Um, it's going to be an interesting one to see how that's handled. But in bullet four. Is, is there a reason special ed was not mentioned? No, I'm, I'm reading through it. Um, no, if, if anything that, that can, that can live with, that can live with me. Um, special education should have been included there. Um, absolutely. Okay. And as I read, you know, basically it's the same statement all the time with respect to what's listed. Um, is there any reason uh, why we, we never mention or additionally focus on school corners who need extra support? They're, they're, they're in the general population, but they're at the bottom end of it and, and struggle without that additional support. Carmen, I, I just, what I didn't hear is I heard everything with it with except a specific student group, if that's what you were referring to, I missed that. Right, uh, which was uh, slow learners. I said they're in the general population, but they have significant needs with, with respect to uh, additional support. I, and I was asking why, why we never even look at that population. I, I, I would say we do um, if, if we're doing our job right. And um, I believe across the district, we have uh, dedicated teachers and every teacher in every classroom is analyzing the needs of their kids. And this comes back to the point you made before, Carmen, which is um, the metrics or the assessments that we are going to be using. And we, we really have a comprehensive approach that we look at that. Uh, formative assessments are the type of assessments that are actually given within the construct of teaching. So while you are in the act of teaching, those are actually the most powerful. And those are the things that we're doing. How can that be done online through distance, uh, distance learning? Common benchmark assessments and summative assessments are other forms. And 
Our teachers are, are continuously analyzing where our students are at. And all of this falls within the multi-tiered systems of support that we've shared before. So um, our schools have, I believe, comprehensive systems and processes in place to identify any student who isn't meeting either IEP goals or typical ac academic progress they should be, be, be meeting. And that's where teachers will initially look at their own instructional practice, reach out to colleagues, work with their staff, and then ultimately should need be, that's where you move into the tier two and tier three supports where you're engaging more of a teamed approach between the district and school resources. But I believe we do that. Okay. Now, I understand and uh, certainly appreciate the short timeline. Uh, it's almost comical. But e even though the timeline is short, and I know people will have an opportunity to give input uh, down the road, it is, in a sense, after the fact. And my question specifically is, uh, why not also have students from the student advisory group, which which then, if we, if we talk, we talk uh, inclusion, we in, we're including everyone. Um, also, why not administrators and teachers, as was stated in, one, in the recent comment from a parent, why not administrators and uh, teachers from elementary and secondary from each of the nine regions uh, having an opportunity to participate in development as opposed to reaction. The, um, in terms of getting their feedback, great question, in terms of, of getting feedback from uh, administrators, and this is actually, um, it connects to uh, the, the public comment that was made regarding making sure that we're hearing from teachers and administrators um, we actually, we engaged uh, representatives of elementary, middle, and our alternative education uh, schools today, as, re as recently as today. Um, the surveys that go out, those surveys went out to staff um, and families. So we will be able to see at the end of the week, the, uh, the, types of, the type of feedback that we've received. Um, and then we're, we're constantly, reaching out when we're when we're examining some ideas and suggestions um, we're working closely with our bargaining units on, on this so we'll make sure that um, Chris uh, and uh, executive cabinet who works closely with uh, with our bargaining unit leaders throughout this process so um, I'm never going to say we're do it, we do it perfectly but um, and I can't stress enough that this is a very different uh, timeline uh, last year, for example, we start our stakeholder engagement. It starts in September and it runs through this, it runs uh, up to the middle of December. With this, it's about a three week process. Um, and part of this also is that one of the things that we'll share with the board, as Shannon had indicated, this plan and those monies go back to March, uh, to the beginning of March. So one of the things that we've also been doing is identifying things that we could um, utilize those resources versus the general fund to do over over the fourth quarter over the fourth quarter of last year and up to this point and so that's the after the fact um, reality of this uh, of this as well but your point is well taken and we we will we will take every effort possible to continue to reach out um, student to when you said student advisory Carmen were, were you referring to to Chris's student advisor the superintendents Correct. Uh, Correct. Student advisory Yes. And that certainly is a group that we that certainly is a group we can reach out to. Um, and so I've I've jotted that down. And then what we can do is reach out to our schools. Some of the schools may be seeking new representatives, but we can certainly um, do that. That's that that's that's a good idea that we can follow up with. Yes, sir. Okay, I, I appreciate that because um, we we want to have a wide representation. Uh, which puts the onus and the responsibility on us as opposed to the same people being selected and or participating in the development. 
plans. Here's a question, and it, it's 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 kind of been on my mind for a long time because it gets uh, stated often, and uh, specifically, it's it's with respect to um, identifying what the highest needs students need for success. And I just have to scratch my head because uh, in that statement that says, uh, we've never been able to do it and neither has anybody else, but now we're gonna figure it out. So can you kind of elaborate on that, Mark? I, I just wanna make sure I'm tracking with you, Carmen. So is the question, what strategies we use to identify um, to, to most accurately identify what students need to be successful? No. That's why I'm glad I asked the question before I responded. In, inherent in the statement is... Carmine, you muted yourself? Can't hear you. No, I didn't. I don't know how that happened. Um, in, inherent in the statement where is is that we have not in the past been able to identify what the quote highest need kids need for success but now we're going to pull a rabbit out of the hat and figure it out how are we going to do that well and so i guess it does go back um a bit i was tracking with you in terms of so how are we going to identify um you know the the mad the, the silver bu bullet or we're going to pull the rabbit out of the hat to um ensure kids are successful um if, if i could answer that question and it was one thing um then um all problems would be solved um it's not easy but here's what i want to here's what i want to say our focus um very concentrated focus over the past several years and we haven't wavered from it and we're not wavering from it moving forward have been on a couple of things one is high quality instruction with a strong emphasis um, and an overarching umbrella of equity and so it's defining it developing it nurturing it and bringing high quality instruction to scale to our approximately 3300 to 3500 teachers across the district how do we what do we mean by that and how do we achieve that the other is all the work through mtss it's all those additional supports and it's processes and system systems in place and as i indicated right at the outset those two things if we have high quality instruction and a strong mtss process we'll be successful with our special education students, our English learners, foster youth students, our homeless students, those that you, you identified, Carmen, that uh, may not line up to those individual groups are African-American students who have traditionally be under, have been underserved. If, we're, if, we get, if we're able to bring high quality instruction to scale, have seamless and comprehensive MTSS supports that provide those additional supports, we're connecting effectively with our family and we're doing all of that work through our lenses of equity, we'll be successful. So I believe we have a formula to do it um, and now it's up to us to get it done. Okay. And the last question, what do you mean by underserved? Your, your definition of underserved? I would say those are students that have, have traditionally, and if we're talking about groups of students, so. When we have, I'll use our African-American students as an example. So our African-American students have historically underperformed as compared to, um, and, and we wanna be careful not necessarily just saying our white students, um, but our higher achieving students. And so rather than saying that those are underperforming students, um, I and we prefer to say that they've been underserved because it's our responsibility to ensure that we're serving those kids and ensuring that they're being successful. Oh, I, and I appreciate that. Uh, a, a, a common, a common thought, however, with that term is that 
they're not given what the rest of the kids get. Uh, and that would be a misnomer because with respect to the curriculum and the support available. Um, yeah, part of that piece, Carmen, to that, to that I, I, hear, I hear what you're saying and then, um, I know where you're coming from. The part is, is that idea of getting each kid what they need when they need it. Um, and each kid needs something different. Correct. Um, and so, so that that's the that's the the the, the thing that we're trying to um, be able to do to have specific opportunities and access. Uh, what we know is we have to we have to um, do that differently um, for individual kids, and that and that's that's the piece that we're trying to uh, figure out how to build a system that actually meets the needs of individual kids. Um, and that's, uh, that's very challenging to do, but that's, that's the work we're taking on. The, the day that all kids had an IEP would be a wonderful day. Agreed. Well, that's it, thank we're you. Good, Mr. Forchina, thank you. Ms. Chiris Espinoza? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Let's see. So first off, a, a question slash cl uh, clarification regarding the $50 million in learning loss mitigation funding. Um, and this will be either for, for Shannon or Mark. Um, am I correct in understanding that this is not $50 million above and beyond our normal funding that we received, that it was in fact $50 million of what ordinarily would have received that was given to us with additional restrictions. Is that accurate? No, these monies are um, completely outside of what we would normally receive. This is everything is on top. Okay. All right. Um, moving on to connectivity, I appreciate the detailed information we've received about uh, devices, um, so Chromebooks and hotspots for students. Um, I am interested in how we're going to meet that need for teachers and other district employees. So with respect to teachers, I know that it is our preference that instruction take place from the classroom or, or from the school site. But for those who need to work from home, whether they're teachers or in a different classification, um, how are we ensuring their connectivity? There's, um, and, and Steve, if there's uh, anything that you wanna add to this, um, there's been specific actions that have been taken um, to ensure, uh, and this is where Steve would be able to respond. I don't mean to put him on the spot, but everything from uh, additional devices to cameras to a, a number of, of devices to ensure that we're getting it into the hands of our teachers. Um, and we've got our, our eyes on our paraeducators as well, because our paraeducators are working um, much more um, this year than directly with students than they did last year. So. Um, I can't give you the exact specifics of the numbers, but you will see that because that actually will be built into the plan that we have. But uh, very careful attention has been taken. Um, and it's not just, um, it's also not just the devices, although obviously that's crucial that they have the devices that they need, that there's software that we're purchasing that will enable them to um, also be more effective in terms of utilizing the online platforms and our, our uh, online curriculum. Yeah, and, and Mark, I, I am here, so I don't know if you probably couldn't see on the screen. So yeah, so to kind of help to kind of go with that. So um, we do have hotspots that are available. We're working with the sites. So we want to, for teachers and families that are working from home, we really prefer to have Wi-Fi versus our cellular hotspots just because of the stability that goes with that and using a cellular connection. So we're really working closely with families if they don't have that. So same for teachers, if they need to work from home. We do have some that we can check out. So we have a process in place where they'd work with their administrator and so on. So we can maybe get a hot, we can get a hot spot to the uh, teachers at home if they need that. And as Mark also alluded to, we have bought some new software that we're getting ready to roll out. So uh, to help with some of the tools that teachers need. And we have bought cameras for every teacher in the district to be able to use. And that can be used in the classroom at home along with some of the equipment from the room like their document cameras to take home if they need to attach that to their home computer as well. So just to clarify, Steve, if uh, an employee, maybe not a teacher, but say a paraeducator or someone, you know, lower in the pay scales, if they don't have Wi-Fi already at home, are you providing that? 
we have the ability to do that. So we're still trying to, to be honest, we're still trying to figure out how to work with the paraeducators and how they're working uh, within the classrooms and how they're going to help best support kids in that way. Uh, so we're trying to figure that component out too, but we do have some hotspots. Uh, we are really starting to, uh, we are starting to really fly through the hotspots that we have right now. Uh, just an example is today we checked out 100 hotspots just today for students. So, um, and we've been going about 60 a day since the last few weeks. So we're really starting to fly through them. And in fact, we had to order a few hundred more just to have them in place. Um, so we can go that, but that's kind of the last resort. We're going to cellular connections at home for people. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Uh, so uh, last spring, our, uh, was it RAD, Research and Data? I forget the acronym, but our, our data team did a very nice job of starting to uh, solicit input from students and families and their distance learning experience. Going forward, uh, I'd like to understand how frequently are we going to ask students, and particularly for younger students, their parents, about their distance learning experience? You know, how, how frequently as a board member can I expect that information? And um, I'd like to be certain that we are oversampling with respect to those historically underserved groups that we like to keep an eye on, excuse me, oversampling so that we can make sure to get representative data, preferably by school site. So can someone talk to me about that? Yes. Um, so, and, and actually I'm glad you referenced, um, referenced this, Nancy, because it, it, uh, it, it reminds me of a point I should have made earlier, which is, um, we're not just going to fall back on the, the information that we, we received um, last spring, but if, um, again, for the, for the general public who may be um, tuning in um, and don't have the full perspective, we did two things last, at the fourth quarter. The first thing that we did very early on was a survey to address connectivity to make sure that our, the, the people, what, what we were just talking about, making sure that our families were connected. Later, in, in, toward the end of the quarter, uh, what we did was a qualitative survey. So we gathered thousands of, of um, uh, responses, and we do track that by individual school. Um, and so that data is actually extremely important for us to go back and look at because that was specific to the experience of distance learning, and we used that data when we were developing the new plan. Moving forward, we'll have a um, it's actually a topic I'm going to be discussing with some folks uh, as early as tomorrow afternoon regarding the frequency, the survey, how we're going to begin going about doing it. So, um, and it's not something that we're going to be doing at the end of every quarter. We're going to be looking at some strategies to get it more fre frequently. It may be, and I'm saying may, um, we may use a combination of surveys that go out quarterly um, to the entire community, but we also may do um, where you, you it, it's random, it's targeted random sampling so that we make sure that we, we are, in fact, we don't have to always get thousands and thousands of responses to get an understanding for, uh, we always want to allow opportunities for anyone who wants to provide feedback. We want to open that up, but we may be looking at a more targeted um, response approach and we'll have uh, information to the board very soon in terms of what our overall strategy is to um, continuously analyze the quality of distance learning. And lastly, we are looking at, um, the board recalls a presentation that I did specific to um, program implementation continuum. If you remember, we looked at a way that we are analyzing implementation of PBIS. We are exploring, we're in the early phases of exploring what would high quality distance learning be? What are those characteristics? And um, what are the metrics? What are the, what's the time? What's the frequency? What are those things? So we're also looking at it from a, a fairly scientific lens so that we could then develop um, also specific school reports regarding the quality of the experience. So um, it's not only on our radar, it's right in front of us and we're very much in the process of developing that. We'll have information coming out very soon to the board and the, and the community should the community want it in terms of how we're what our plan is to get that qualitative feedback. That's encouraging. Thank you, Mr. Are you finished, Ms. Chairs? I am, thank you. Okay. Dr. Martinez-Solier? 
So I would like to thank you, Mark, for your presentation and Mrs. Hayes. I think early on um, I had some questions about the strings attached when we talked about um, the federal government funding. Um, and so thank you for thoroughly explaining that now in this presentation. So I had a few questions um, on slide nine to 10. Um, when we talk about elementary schools and the secondary education, um, is the incorporation of pre-K um, also included in that as well for funding? Um, yes and no. So pre-K in and of itself, the way it's funded has received an influx of funds through um, their Head Start program. They don't typically include pre-K when they give us money because we don't earn ADA, we don't earn state revenue from um, gen ed preschool students. Um, okay. So I could see us using some of this. TK definitely, so TK through um, 12th grade, um, but I don't I don't see, if it, if it meets the terms of the funding source, I don't see any reason why we couldn't help with our gen ed pre-K students, just like we do with our special ed pre-K students. Okay, because I was just thinking when we're talking about the funding and dating back to the March 1st, that was another group, you know, impacted of students where we might be able to apply some of these funds instead of general funds, um, just thinking okay. of ways to maneuver the budget. Um, also, um, Mr. Cerruti, do you foresee, based on the needs that we get back or the needs analysis, um, eventually po the possibility of a potential of a new curriculum or online learning model based on some of the feedback from the site levels or even the parents and families? In terms of a new curriculum, um, so my, my short answer to that is probably not, but let me explain why. Um, we are, we're always exploring uh, and analyzing our curriculum um, in terms of its, its effectiveness, one, for our teachers to deliver it, and two, for our, for our kids. Um, but what, one of the things that this has done, um, if we're looking for a silver lining in the craziness that we're, we're in right now, is uh, the curriculum that we've adopted over the past several years has extensive um, online curriculum that could apply very well to the circumstances that we're under. Um, and so I think what we'll, what we'll be doing is there's really two things. Anytime that we're looking at the effectiveness that we're having as a teacher, anytime you're looking at the effectiveness that you're having with kids, you're looking at your lesson planning, how you deliver that lesson and the content of that lesson. And certainly if we're seeing significant gaps, our steering committees are gonna to continue to work. We have an assessment steering committee that has over 40 teachers represented that includes elementary, middle, high school, special education, uh, English learner coordinators are connected to that, our Department of Curriculum and Professional Learning. So we're continuously analyzing it, but if, if I was pressed on, do you think we will need to adopt new curriculum um, it's too early to tell right now. We've got processes in place to analyze it, but I think our curriculum is probably solid. It's continuing to get um, an understanding of how best to deliver it under full distance learning conditions. Yeah, follow up to follow up on that. I think you know, that idea is, I think what may change long term in this whole thing is the number of students and families that are going to prefer a different delivery model. So the curriculum itself might not be different because we're right now the expectation is first grade is first grade. And even when we were going to have um, a remote learning and a, uh, uh, and a transition model happening at the same time, we still wanted the curriculum to be the curriculum. The difference was the delivery model. So when this all comes to pass, uh, but I, I do think there's going to be more families and more students that have determine that this distance process does work well for them and they're going to want to continue in that um, in that mode um, long term. So I do think we'll have more families doing that, but the curriculum won't necessarily be different. But how we deliver it long term, I think there'll be more families that choose to do a distance version. Thank you. I just wanted to mention that because if we are addressing or talking about learning gaps or learning loss, sometimes it might be a different method 
Um, I, I do like how it was mentioned previously too, the opportunity where we may be able to do something different or extension of the day type courses. So I'm just looking for the future and down the road. Um, I also wanted to make a note that I appreciated as well the um, last slide with the focus um, on or the second to last slide regarding the mental health and the different services. Um, I think there's potential as well on um, the second bullet point where there could be some additional maybe counseling services to families or a way to help provide additional support at home but also um, addressing to the professional development of our staff um, as well um, for any areas that they might be able or be concerned about especially right now with the distance learning and having to go solely online so I really appreciate that slide um, additionally. And then um, my Dr. final, go ahead. I'm, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean, I didn't mean to interrupt. Um, but just to point out that that is also an area of focus and that that is being planned um, and will be provided. Um, we're looking at individual support as well as potential small group support and um, very well likely could be embedded within the school day, but also outside of the school day. So we are, we are looking very carefully at that and those types of services will be provided. And then my final comment, just uh, to mention that I'll be looking forward as well to seeing what a transition plan would be utilized and identifying ways um, to utilize the funds. I know prior to this, when we thought we would have some type of in-person instruction and online at the same time, we were able to tour the, the school site and give example where we um, had some plexiglass going into the front office or different locations trying to remain the social distancing. So I think that's going to be vital to having those funds identified and set aside moving forward when we do transition back. Great point. Are you finished, Ms. Dr. Leary? Thank you. Mr. Madison? Thank you, Madam President. Uh, I have a question with uh, Chris or Shannon. We talked about the, uh, the funds expire in December. Uh, there was some legislation that we was possibly trying to extend that. Yeah, so I can speak to that. So one of the things we've been we've been working uh, with our local um, electeds um, at the um, so I will give Congressman Barra um, a shout out. He has been uh, he's listened um, and he's actually championing uh, the concept of extending that uh, deadline from the December uh, end of December through either um, June um, and or September of 2021, which is the end of the school year, which means then we could systematically, all these ideas that were coming up, and then we could systematically do them all year long instead of having to do them part of the year, maybe not um, in, in the latter part of the year. So if all works out in the, and at the federal level, they can come up with a second stimulus package, um, it looks very promising that there will be language that's already been written um, that will be inserted in that second phase that would extend the timeline uh, for these funds. So we're hoping, you know, again, that the, the federal folks can um, get together and come up with a, with a plan they can agree on. We might have an answer for you um, as early as the, the work board workshop um, next week, fingers crossed. Uh, that we'll be able to tell you that the plan that we'll be doing will really be a full year plan instead of a scramble to try to get some things done before December. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to see where we were with that at this time. So, so we'll hopefully hear something in a couple of weeks. Uh, the as it relates to the SB 117 on the COVID-19 uh, response fund, I guess the question I have it went, as it relates to testing, is there something in our plan as a large school district with the, the testing mechanism, with the money we have, any way that we can facilitate or enhance the testing from our viewpoint? Yeah, so we're actually working um, with the other school districts in the um, at the county Chris, office. Chris, we lost, lost you. We're actually working with the other school districts is as far as you got. So we're working with the other school districts in the county and actually uh, Dr. Bielenson um, at the county health department is also being um, a huge advocate for this. So 
we're working through a process right now to secure uh, testing that would be available. And we're, we're not going to get to a point in the short term where we're going to be able to test you know, every employee every two weeks. But the ability to, when we have someone that we and exposed, that Chris, we you broke again. The ability when we have someone. The ability when we have someone that that is uh, that we believe may um, be infected or showing symptoms, that we will be able to prioritize them to be tested and get those results back in um, in a shorter period than is currently available. So that work is being done, and we're doing it as a as a group within Sacramento County with the support of the county um, health department. So I'm actually, uh, I want to announce that it's done, but the um, it's very promising and the work is uh, in that area. So we're, we're excited about it. I will keep you informed as we move forward with that. But we could use some of these funds to fund that because we will have to pay for those tests. The county's not in a place to be able to, um, to fund those tests, but they may be in the position to uh, facilitate us getting in line ahead of others to get the testing done. Uh, but we would have to use funds to pay for that. Well, I, I think those funds would be well used in that area, particularly having the large amount of teacher staff we have and the student body we have. So I was curious about that. So you'll give us more update on that. I will. Thank you. Uh, now, just to touch on the last uh, point I had was the, uh, the highest need students a lot of my colleagues have brought that up. And uh, Mark, uh, just a question I had. You know, I went through David Bird's uh, uh, write up with the Title I evaluations uh, for all our Title I schools. And for me, it seems to me we can use that as a benchmark, even though that was school year 18, 19. And that was in real time. Is that correct? Yes. And there's some awful scores in there. And when we talk about our highest need uh, kids in schools, I would certainly like to see that as a benchmark. I'm not going to name schools out or anything. You, you folks have data and information, and Dave Bird is, David Bird's doing a good job in that area and pointing things out. And, and I would like to see that plan and plus the mitigation part of it as well the schools with these high needs you want to comment on that or well there's certainly no question that the the, our, the focus and and mr bird will focus um heavily on our our title schools and um we see pockets of success um with our title schools but we don't see the level of progress and I don't think any any teacher or any principal or any of us would feel um, satisfied with the level of success that we've had across the district in, in our title schools. Um, so we will continue to stay focused on the quality of our instruction and as Chris had indicated during this time the curriculum will stay solid. It's our delivery, um, our support to the families, our support to our teachers, our support to those kids and so um, in terms of, of being satisfied with the results, I'm not, and we're not. Um, but what we are doing is, as I indicated, we have some schools and some classrooms where there is phenomenal things that are taking place and there is success. And that's why we're digging in to find out exactly what's happening there and replicating that to the greatest degree, degree possible in all of those classrooms across the district. Just to build on that for you, Mr. Madison, the one thing I want to say is for this, for our, for our new version of this plan, the, the learning loss piece, is we're not just looking for new data that we discover in the next 10 days. You're right. There is already long-term existing data that tells us where we need to spend um, and, and secure more resources. We, we already know that um, in a number of places. So uh, we're going to use existing data, the Title I, um, work is a, certainly a place to um, to look. The feedback we received last spring is certainly places that we should, and we want to use that data, and we're going to continue to collect data moving forward, but we're not going to come up with a magical set of data in the next 10 days that's going to inform this plan. Uh, the We know we know where we need to uh, focus um, our efforts, and much of that data, um, no matter how many times you take it, 
you get the same information. I mean, the the, the results um, often point to the same um, to the same challenges. So uh, we're, we are going to rely on um, existing data um, as well as trying to get um, new feedback from um, our stakeholders based on things have changed. You know, in the last uh, last six months as well. But that doesn't mean we. Chris, ignore. Things have changed in the last six months, I guess you. So things have changed dramatically in the last six months. So we want to get real time information from people because that's that's important. But it doesn't mean that we um, forget about or don't pay attention to existing data that we've been working with for a long time. No, and I understand that, Chris. And I'm not trying to just pick at things. You know, I get real concern, and I brought it up a number of times, are particularly elementary schools. I mean, uh, how we can truly help, and that's going to be a real challenge, and I get that, particularly with, with DL learning. Uh, but that's where we're failing, and we have been failing, into the elementary portions of our schools, particularly the Title I schools. So I'm just bringing that up. I know it's it's sort of old data, data, for, data from the CAS, but we still need to pay a lot of attention to that. When we talk about where's our highest needs and where we want to spend money, how we're going to spend it, who's going to get in there and and get it done to help. If I have a real concern, this was in real time, and now we're in distance learning time. So it, it's a tall order that we have in front of us right now. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Madison. Mr. Perez. Okay. Well, I like to begin that I had an issue accessing your report, Mark, this afternoon, yesterday. And so what I did, I just went to the Department of Education and looked this up uh, and start educating myself on this issue. And I came across the uh, uh, Senate Bill number 98 that was revised and passed and uh, just last June, signed by the Governor Newsom and the legislators. So uh, going through that document all the way to page 20, I learned a lot regarding things that we need to do that you didn't address in your report. Uh, one big thing right here on page uh, 13 of the report, it states that this bill will appropriate $750,000 to the department for the allocation to the Sacramento County Superintendent of Schools to develop under direction of the Executive Director of the State Board of Education, draft distance learning, curriculum, and instructional guidance for mathematics, English language arts, English language development, as provided. This bill will require the State Board to adopt a distance learning curriculum instructional guidance by May 31st, 2021. So we need to see these reports. That's, that's SCOE, that's not us. Yes, but yet we should be working in conjunction with the County of Education over there because eventually they're going to be in our classroom curriculum of studies. Yeah, we, have, we have a program. very good relationship. Giving, giving input. We have a very good relationship with our county office of ed, and we have staff involved with all of the major um, initiatives that they're doing. Um, we work very collaboratively. Um, Mr. Gordon, as a former superintendent of Elk Grove Unified, um, he always makes sure that we are um, included in those processes. I mean, just like developing the guidelines, um, you know, back in March and April, uh, that work was done collaboratively with all 13 superintendents across the county. Um, and we meet every Tuesday morning. Um, and we're, so we're definitely connected with, uh, with, the, with SCOE. They do a great job in supporting us. Um, and we support them where, um, when we have the opportunity to do so as well. Well, in the report earlier, there was no mention of this money and we're spo supposed to be working collaboration. It yeah, but it's not, it's not money that's it's not money that's that's directed to us that's money that's directed at SCOE so that'll be in their plan to include us right 
So we should be at the forefront since we're the biggest school in the county. Another thing that I learned out that um, the California Collaborative for Educational Excellence is going to require the de Department of Education to work with County Office of Education to administrator to administrate the Dalexia, California Dalexia Initiative. That was this, which Carmen Forsina was referring to, slow learners and issues learning with the uh, in a school classroom setting. So hopefully we get tied with that program. Looks like there's also general fund money for classified school employees summer assistance program. We need to get a hold of that $60 million general fund monies for our school employees for the summer assistance program. Excellent description there. Looks like they're also working with the Young People's Task Force. We should get our representatives from Elk Grove Unified School District on that task force of youth and giving input. Very similar to the ones they gave tonight, the Unity Council. There's many things on here they address that your administrative staff there needs to read and come back to us ASAP regarding uh, especially after school programs, after school education safety programs. There's a lot of- Those, are, those, are, those are under development, Mr. Perez. Yes, I know that, yes. So anyway, um, you know, I'm kind of, uh, you know, I, I initiated the program at Rudder Junior High for the uh, 21 century job skills, but yet, you know, we don't get a recognition on that. Mr. Epstein has produced excellent students reports, and yet that's a model program we should be implementing district Mr. Perez, Mr. Perez, we need to be talking about this. The learning okay, yes. attendance plan yes. report we were given tonight, please. And this is a this is an after school educational safety program act program. So uh and it says that they're gonna establish Existing law establishes a 21 century high school after school safety enrichment for teens high school assets programs. Money's there. Great. Money's there. Okay, looks like they're also going to establish, you met. Mr. Uh, Madison mentioned our English language learners. Mr. Perez? Yes. Okay, we're talking about our plan that we have to have turned in in less than six weeks. Yes, So exactly. I, I see there's many things in yours that you're referring to that are getting developed, and I think you've made it really clear that you'd like us to be active participants as those get developed. Yes, but I'm going to refer to this issue regarding uh, Mr. Madison brought up regarding English language learners. There's also existing uh, bilingual teacher professional development programs that we need to get involved in for our area three and area one. We have uh, many uh, English language learners within our district and we should get staff to participate in the training programs, developmental programs for bilingual ed teacher training but not for English learners in the rest of the district? Also those four, exactly. I was gonna mention that too. They also have a program for migrant ed students, migrant ed programs that we should get in, uh, in the loop of you'll, funding. You'll see, you'll, you'll see something in the plan we already know that will be coming forward, which will be an expansion of uh, a support system that we're using currently for migrant ed students that right. we're actually gonna to expand to all of our English learners. Um, and we said in our initial conversations, uh, we know that's going to be one of the recommendations that comes forward. So our English language learner students are certainly going to be on our radar. Okay, here's, a, here's another program, number seven, a full day kindergarten facility grant program. Yeah, they actually took money away from that. $300 million. Yeah. 
Yeah, they reduced, we should get a piece of that cake. They reduced that, um, those funds. And in order to do that, we'd have to hire twice as many um, kindergarten teachers as we have now. And the facility costs would be significantly more than the state's providing. So those. Well, according to this report, one of the requirements is the daycare services for our students. And which you have not mentioned or anybody has been mentioned for the administrative office. It, it says that one of the requirements we're supposed to provide daycare for these students. We're providing daycares across the across the district. We've been doing it since March. I'm talking about the fifth. Looks like though they want fifth graders, fourth graders, younger ones daycare. Mr. Perez, are you um you're You yes. froze this. You're cutting out. Are, are you reading through Senate Bill 98, Mr. Press? Yes, I'm, learned, I'm reading from the Learning Continuation uh, and Attendance Plan within okay. the Department of Education. If you go to that site, they, they want you to read Senate Bill number 28 that was signed June by the governor and that was legislatively pass through the assembly and the Senate. So these are budgetary items that we need to pursue. Okay, Mr. Education. Hoffman, have you read this bill he is speaking of? Yeah, we're Both using it, we're using it extensively in the planning for this uh, plan that we have to do. It was also fundamental in the negotiations that we've done with our associations, specifically with um, EGA and a lot of the language that's in that, um, in that bill is what we used in coming up with the um, schedules that we're now implementing at our schools. So we're very familiar with the document. I will say that the state is still coming up with guidance to explain what much of that means because it's one thing to read just the straight um, language of any given bill, but until you get the interpretation of it and the guidelines that come along with it, um, sometimes those things don't make a great deal of sense because legislation, um, making legislation turn into reality is often the challenge. And so uh, there are regulations and guidelines that are being developed and we're following those as well. All right. You know, they're very, they're very concerned regarding the stakeholders, the parents, the community. And they wanna know how the governing board must provide options for remote participation in the public hearings and the public meetings in which the learning continuation plan is adopted. So these are some of the issues that I'm concerned about that were not addressed in this presentation. So I want to bring it up to your attention that we need to do some more homework and get in the loop of this funding. <laughs> Beyond the LCFF funding, this is more funding for our community of students in need in area one and three. Mr. Press, Mr. Press. Two. When you say you only need things for area one and three, there are students throughout our whole district that need oh, things. Oh, yes, I understand sir. that. But the majority of poverty, I just want to emphasize the, the third grade reading level and Title I's programs are in area one and three. So I'm advocating that we need to do a little bit more for these geographical areas. Yes, and we've, we've definitely made it a major point of this presentation. Yeah. So on what we have defined again tonight as underserved populations. Yes. And we're talking about the achievement gap, the learning loss. You know, now that we have the, we had achievement gap, now we have the learning, learning loss on top of that. And like, you know, I understand that this is a, through this distance learning, it's, a little, it's going to be a little bit harder. You know, like Mr. Madison said, you know, this is a unique situation, but we got to do our best. Yes, thank you. I'm Are we good? Finished, but I'm going to cut it short. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for the help. Appreciate it. Okay, okay thank you, Mr. Perez. Um, I just have oh. one comment. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Perez. Are you done? If you're done, will you mute? If you're not, I didn't mean to cut you off. Okay. Um, well, I just want to say thank you and continue the hard work. <laughs> okay. Um, the public probably does not realize when we do an LCAP, it, it, as Mark had, and Mr. Shruti had mentioned, it's a nine-month process we go through. And on every site, 
they develop an LCAP that is then fed into our district LCAP and it, it, it is an insurance of, of including all members of our community and our district. So I think it is unrealistic that it is possible to do in the next six weeks and the new um, that you froze for a second though. Okay, so I think it's unrealistic that we can do that this time. We have no time. But I would encourage that while we do this at the large stage, we still do some semblance of this on each site because it provides the site a time to meet with their population, their school site councils, their English learner groups, their, um, their special groups to go over and hear the concern of what we do when we build our LCAP school by school. And due to the situation, we're not going to be able to do that this year. But Mark, I would highly encourage us to do something similar still site by site. Thank you. Um, so that is it. We do not need to vote. That was a report. So we will move on to public hearing action items. Number one, the memorandum of understanding between Elk Grove Unified School District, Transient Union for the 2019-2020 school year. Mr. Riley. Thank you, President Albiani, members of the board, Superintendent Hoffman, Ms. Avalos. The Memorandum of Understanding completely resolves negotiations for the 2019-2020 school year and extends the current collective bargaining agreement between ATU and the district through June 30th, 2021 with 2020-21 school year reopeners. The EGUSD board should be asked to approve, ratify the attached 2019-2020 ATU Memorandum of Understanding there's no impact from the ATU MOU on the district's budget. Therefore, the AB 1200 process is inapplicable. Thank you. Ms. Pinkerton, is there any public comment? Madam Board related? President Albion, <laughs> there are no public comments related to this item. Thank you. I'd like to open a public hearing on this item. And now that Ms. Pinkerton has let us know there's been no comment, would like to close the public hearing and call for a motion to and a second to approve the memorandum of understanding or MOU between Elk Grove Unified School District you for the 2019-2020 school year. Mm -hmm. Ms. Allen. Oh. No, I need the motion. Thank you. Uh, was that a motion from Bob? I apologize, I'd call for the motion again. No moved. We have a moved by Mr. Perez, a second by Ms. Cheris Espinoza. We will conduct a roll call vote, Ms. Singh Allen. Aye. Mr. Perez. Aye. Aye. You, you froze, Beth, sorry. Mr. Madison. Aye. Thank you. Dr. Martina Salir. Aye. Ms. Cheris Espinoza. Aye. Mr. Fortina. Aye. Thank you, it is unanimous. Our second item, consideration of the public notice of ATU's initial proposal to the district regarding collective bargaining for the 2020-2021 school year. Mr. Riley. Section 3547, the following are stipulated for negotiations between the bargaining unit and the district. One, the union's initial proposal is officially presented at a public meeting of the governing board for public notice. And two, a public hearing is conducted to receive public input regarding the union's initial proposal. ATU's initial proposal is attached. It is recommended that after the closure of the public hearing, the board take action to accept ATU's initial proposal. Thank you, Mr. Riley. I'd like to open a public hearing and call Ms. Pinkerton if there is any public comment related to this item. Madam Board President Albiani, there are no public comments related to this item. Thank you. Then I will close the public hearing and call for a motion and a second to approve the ATU's initial proposal to the district regarding collective bargaining 
for the 2020-2021 school year. So, so moved. moved. Second. Moved by Ms. Sing Allen, seconded by Mr. Madison. Um, a roll call vote, Mr. Forcina. Mr. Forcina. Aye. Thank you. Ms. Cheris Espinoza. Aye. Dr. Martina Salir. Aye. Mr. Madison. Aye. Mr. Perez. Aye. Ms. Singh Allen. Aye. And myself is an aye, so that's unanimous. Thank you. Number three, the side letter of agreement between Elk Grove Unified School District, EGUSD, and the Elk Grove Education Association, EGEA, regarding negotiations for the 2019-2020 school year. Mr. Riley. The parties agree that this agreement completes all reopener negotiations sunshine by the parties for the 2019-20 school year and that there shall be no change to any provision of the party's collective bargaining agreement except those provided in this agreement. The parties agree to create a new collective bargaining agreement between EGEA and the district for the term of July 1, 2020 through June 30th, 2021. The EGUSD board should be asked to approve, ratify the attached side letter of agreement between EGUSD and EGEA. There is no impact from this side letter of agreement on the district's budget. Therefore, the AB 1200 process is inapplicable. Thank you. I'd like to open a public hearing and call on Ms. Pinkerton to read any public comment related to this item. Madam Board President Albiani, there are no public comments related to this item. Thank you. Then I will close the public hearing and call for a motion and a second to approve the side letter agreement between EGUSD and EGEA regarding negotiations for the 2019-2020 school year. So moved. For a second. second. For a second and by Mr. Madison. Ms. Singh Allen. Aye. Mr. Perez. Aye. Mr. Madison. Aye. Dr. Martina Salir. Aye. Ms. Cheris Espinoza? Aye. Mr. Fortina? Aye. And myself is an aye. Thank you. That is passed unanimously. Action items. Number one, a resolution to eliminate classified position. Ms. Pinkerton, is there any public comment related to this item? Madam Board President Albiani, there are no public comments related to this item. Thank you. Mr. Riley. Mr. Riley, you're on mute. I knew that was gonna happen at least once. Thank you, <laughs> President Albion. The board is asked to adopt the attached resolution to eliminate classified position due to lack of work, lack of funds pursuant to education code sections 45114, 45298, 45308, and 45117. Thank you. I need to call for a motion to and a second to adopt resolution number five, authorizing the governing board to eliminate a classified position. Moved. Second. Okay. Moved by Ms. Cheris Espinoza, second by Dr. Martina Salir. Mr. Forchina. Aye. Ms. Cheris Espinoza. Aye. Dr. Martina Salir. Aye. Mr. Madison. Aye. Mr. Perez? Aye. Ms. Singh Allen? Aye. And myself as an aye, that is unanimous, thank you. Number two, Elk Grove Unified School District's Community Facilities District 2020-2021 tax report and second reading of ordinance number one, 2020-2021. Ms. Pinkerton, is there any public comment related to this item? Madam Board President Albiani, there are no public comments related to this item. Thank you. Mr. Pierce? You're on mute, Mr. Pierce. How about now? Not now. You're good. <laughs> Thank you, President Albiani, members hey, of the Mr. board. Mr. Perez, will you mute yourself? Hall. I apologize. Mr. Pierce? All right. I'll do this for a third time. Thank you, President Albiani, members of the board, Superintendent Hopp and Ms. Avalos. This is a follow-up item to your July 21st board meeting. Um, where you also conducted a public hearing. Uh, this is an annual item whereby the board sets the tax rate for each property in community facility district number one, 
and in this case for the 2020-2021 tax year. Uh, the ordinance before you tonight includes the adoption of the annual tax report and the establishment of the tax rates in the CFD. This is a good year. It's an encouraging year. Um, your tax revenues are up. It's the first time in three years. Um, so it's a good indication of what's happening in the housing market. Uh, the board tonight would be acting on behalf of the Elk Grove Unified School District. Is asked to adopt. The froze, Mr. Pierce. The board would be acting on behalf of the Elk Grove Unified School District Community Facilities District Number One. You're asked to adopt Ordinance Number One, 2020-2021, and direct administration to deliver the tax report to the Sacramento County Auditor's Office no later than August 14th. Thank you. I would like to call for a motion and a second to approve the Elk Grove Unified School District Community Facilities District 2020-2021 tax report and the 2020-2021 ordinance number one. So moved. Second. Moved by Ms. Singh Allen, second in my Ms. Espinoza. Perez Espinoza. Ms. Singh Allen. Aye. Thank you, Mr. Perez. Aye. Thank you, Mr. Madison. Aye. Dr. Martinez Salir. Aye. Ms. Cheris Espinoza. Aye. Mr. Forchina. Aye. And myself as an aye. It's unanimous, thank you. Another action item, Education Code Section 17556. I don't even know how to read that. Consideration of resolution of intent to convey water pipeline easement to the Floor and Resource Conservation District for the Joseph Kerr Middle School project. And it is just that, President Albiani. So as shared with the board in a previous board communication, there's gonna be a couple of these coming forward to you in the form of public utility easements. Um, it's exciting because it entails the comprehensive modernization project at Joseph Kerr Middle School. As part of this project, we will be abandoning all of the existing public utility infrastructure at the school. We're installing all new infrastructure to replace the approximately 80 year old infrastructure that's in place at that campus. So here's to another 80 years at Joseph Kerr Middle School. Uh, tonight's the first step in this process. It entails an easement being granted to the Florin Resources Conservation District administered by the Elk Grove Water District for a water pipeline maintenance in two areas at Joseph Kerr Middle School, one on the southwestern border of the campus and one on the eastern border of the campus. Um, tonight is the resolution of intention. It does require two thirds of a vote by the board to approve it. Um, with your approval, we'll post this notice of intention throughout the district, as well as publish it in the Sacramento Bee. And again, this does require action of you formally again this does require action and if approved there will be a resolution coming before you on september 1st where you are formally convey the easement itself thank you miss pinkerton is there any public comment on this madam board president albiani there are no public comments on this item hmm. we have any questions from the board or, or i would like to call for a motion to vote all right, I would like to call for a motion and a second to adopt resolution number one, intention to convey water pipeline. You froze Joseph, <laughs> Intention to convey. Water pipeline easements to the Floor and Resource Conservation District for the Joseph Kerr Middle School Project and announce that a public hearing will be held at the regular board meeting on September 1st, 2020. Google oh. ordinance one. Moved by Mr. Forcina, seconded by Ms. Singh Allen. Mr. Forcina. Aye. Ms. Cheris Espinoza. Aye. Dr. Martinez Salir. Aye. Mr. Madison. Aye. Mr. Perez. Aye. Ms. Singh Allen. Aye. And myself as an aye, so it is unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. You try to talk so fast you can't get frozen. Oh, we are at board member and superintendent in port. It Remember, uh, I think the easiest I'll just go through and if you'd like to unmute yourself, if you had something to report, 
about a, a committee work you have done. Mr. Forcina? No? Ms. Chair Espinoza? No report, but looking forward to the board architect subcommittee meeting to approve uh, some of the work that was discussed. And I'm also pleased to hear about um, our, our DLAC and our other advisory committees. And I understand our district finance committee is also gonna to start to meet soon. So just uh, looking forward to that. That's great. And I believe Mr. Forchina and Mr. Madison will join you on the architectural group. Mr. Madison? Yeah, I have a couple of reports. I, I'm on the uh, IYT Executive Strategy Committee. And that committee, I think Mr. Hoffman is on it, Superintendent Hoffman as well. Where IYT was, means? Yes, IYT. And the strategy is a 1300 campaign. We have some esteemed people on there. I think uh, Senator Pan, Dr. Bush, the CRC, and uh, President Nelson at Sac State, and other uh, county members all around. So, the intent is in trying to enhance uh, young boys and men of color, why we don't have more in our universities, particularly UC Davis and Sac State. So we're working on that committee as well. So it's quite interesting. And uh, I think it's, uh, it's gonna go all the way through what, September, Chris, or towards the latter part of the year that we're working on. Yes, and also I, I would like to uh, acknowledge Mr. Murray that he sets in on the IYT uh, committee for for um, education strategy committee. So I have kudos to him as well that he sets on and give his input as relates to uh, young men of color as well that they're strategizing for uh, attending college. That's it. Thank you. Uh for those who do not know, IYT, Mr. Press, you're next. I'll, I'll be there. Um, IYT stands for Improve Your Tomorrow. That, that's, I, absolutely, that's absolutely correct. Thank you, Madam President. Can I ask Chet a question? Of course. But you have to unmute yourself. Yeah, I was doing that. I was looking for it. Um, Chet, there's been lots of discussions about the need to support activities that have proven success. And so as we move forward, would you uh, agree that IYT is something that the board should direct funds towards so that we can expand uh, that program into more schools than we currently utilize it? I think right now we've got uh, Florin High School, Valley High School, Monterey Trail High School, and we've got the uh, middle school Jackman and Harrison, I believe, Chris. Yeah, we have it at uh, Jackman Runner um, and Harris is coming on, coming online. Right. So, well, yeah, they're they're constantly trying to expand. Um, I think they're they're doing a really good job. Sometimes it's hard to measure certain things, but if any of you ever had to attend some of their functions, you would you would see heartbreaking stories in there. And I think it's going to really pay dividends down the road. It, it it already has. You go and attend some of these meetings and watch some of these young fellows, uh, young men of color, Hispanics, African Americans even Asians, it's just, it's, it's something to be told. And yes, to answer your question, I would like to see more funds directed towards that area. I know we have some in our priorities now, but more will be needed down the road. And I think it's gonna really help in many ways. Uh, achievement gaps, uh, we can look into our elementary school for potential. Uh, and we haven't even touched the, the actual, um, female shed that also has <clears throat> some struggles. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot. And I think we can really set an example for something that could be looked at in the country. So thank you. And I will say I do spend a lot of time with Michael and Michael um, and, um, and they're doing phenomenal work. And one thing that I am really impressed with them as well is they're not just looking to expand to expand. 
Um, so they actually, this particular year, they said, we want to hold on and make sure that we're, we're bringing on the right people um, and training them in the right way so that the quality of the program stays in place. So they're very mindful about the quality of the program and growing it um, at the same time. So we, we spend um, quite a bit of time together. We check in at least twice a year, just, just the three of us. As well, so Mr. It's, it's Hoffman, definitely good work. you froze. You check in three times a year. If you want to add anything past that? So, yeah, so I check in with with the three of us. Uh, Michael, Michael, and I check in uh, just the three of us uh, a couple times a year. Plus the other committees I sit on with Mr. Madison, and they're very mindful about um, growing the program, but growing the program um, and making sure the quality of it um, doesn't diminish as they're growing. And so uh, there's that balance of how fast it grows with how, um, how well people are trained and brought on. Yeah, that, that's an excellent point, Chris. I appreciate you clarifying that as well too. And if any of my colleagues, you can go on their website and you can see some of the testimonies. It's, uh, it's quite interesting. They are growing, but they want to grow at a pace that they can truly serve uh, the young men of color, and, and I think they're doing that right now. So, well, yeah, that was an important question for me, Chet, because as a board, we can pass all the policies and procedures, and administration can pass all the ARs they want, which say to people that they have to be uh, more receptive in terms of. Uh, the provision of opportunities and the way in which they look at how we work with kids, but this would be a concrete step. And that's how I see it different than I can tell you all day long. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to take you to play a round of golf, but if I never do it because it's too expensive, then, then the words mean nothing. And that's how I look a lot of times at policies and procedures. If you don't put any teeth with them, there are a lot of empty words. And, and, and maybe that's being too harsh because I, I know that, that the policies that we have around equity uh, are, are, are heartfelt by everyone, but, but you got to take another step. And that, that step to me is taking the positive action of committing dollars so that the resources necessary can help. And yeah, YT program, they're incredible. And uh, it would be nice to uh, allow them to expand as they believe that they could uh, do so in a successful way. So thank you. Yes, and I, and I stress just as, as Chris uh, brought up, we want the quality end of it. I've also had conversations with uh, the two Michaels and the one thing I stress to them, you know, we want to do it right. You don't want to expand. Everybody's pulling at them right now. Uh, some of the success they've had, but they have kind of tempered off a little bit because they still, they want to do the right, right thing. And when they bring people aboard to work for them, they have to be the right people and to make sure that we're going to educate these kids and you'll see more results as we go down, down the road. So yeah, Carmen, I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Madison, Mr. Fortuna, and Mr. Hoffman. Mr. Perez, you're up. You're muted, you Mr. Perez. Okay. Now we can uh, hear you. All right. Okay, I guess I'm gonna have to confess that I've been working uh, as a committee of one with the UC system. Um, Dr. Burke, who has been just recently appointed to the UC presidency of the UC system, has a, an excellent record recruiting students of color at UC Irvine. Now that he's the head of the UC system, you're going to get more resources in this project. And, uh, and I brought up earlier that, you know, I, I do this annual Cesar Chavez Youth Conference which is aimed to do that, yet I cannot get participation. I cannot get uh, students from this district. In fact, I have uh, some data sets. I like to show you one of these days that who 
participates in that annual conference, Cesar Chavez Youth Conference. And since that time, we've been working the last, what, 30, 40 years on this project. And today, UC Davis is recognized as a Hispanic serving institute. Of all the UC systems, I think we have nine or 10 UC uh, universities designation as Hispanic serving institutes. And that requirement is 25% of the student body has to be Latinos. And they have the same program for Asians, Native Americans, African Americans. And Dr. Mays at UC Davis is very concerned of the underrepresentation of African Americans at his university. So he's working on that project very uh, heavily with Dr. Blast and the recruitment unit. And so you need to get with Dr. Blas and recruitment, and, and there's also these programs that have been around. They go to elementary schools, they go to junior highs, and they go to high schools and they mentor and do a variety of presentations to these students uh, throughout the whole California. And so, and they have an excellent retention program. Uh, student, um, because they're, they're recognized as Hispanic serving institutions, or whatever, they get extra federal dollars to for retention, counseling, career development, workshops, you name it. So it's been a very successful program at UC Davis. Uh, uh, the President Mays is very supportive of this. And we also work with the coalition. Well, we always have worked with Third World uh, Liberation Front, but also at the, at the UC system, we have another, uh, or at the state, uh, state, of, of state uh, department, uh, state departments, we have uh, California, my, it used to be the mi minority my, uh, state workers association. So we have a coalitions at state and also uh, at now at the UC system. So we're de developing a, 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 a colleagues pipeline of alumni who have been successful, who are retired like me, working on this project with uh, the board president, John Perez, who's also very supportive on this issue. That's one of his goals. And we do go well, uh, uh, throughout California doing workshops, doing this, uh, this objective, but also to Mexico City. We have the Mexican Initiative and we, we're in the process of possibly, uh, what do you call it, uh, recruiting uh, bilingual, bicultural teachers from uh, Mexico to the Mexican consulate. That's one of the projects they want to do. So as you know, as as we get, as we get more funding for these type of things and getting the right people at higher levels of government and and boards, we're going to see better outcomes. And like I said. Um, takes time. <laughs> uh, me, uh, I'm happy to meet with you and talk, talk those through, Mr. Perez. I set some time. We can, we can definitely talk about those. Yes, uh, they're very supportive. And uh, it's my understanding also, uh, they have put a lot of money. They're going to give a lot of support with Dr. Burke to do this recruitment and the, this project uh, that's the uh, uh, YIT. And also through the African American or Black Caucus of the, of the legislature, the Chicano Latino Caucus, the Asian Caucus, the Native American Caucus of one, Mr. Ramos, Assemblyman Ramos from San Bernardino. So they're all working on this thing and making sure that these, that this college pipeline exists and is supported 110%. Mr. Perez, that sounds Thank like you. great information you can bring back to us. I love the well, name hold, hold college pipeline. Yeah. Well, then I wanted, I wanted staff to invite uh, the Hispanic uh, Serving Institute uh, director and give a presentation to you because that's a model program that we've, we developed uh, and been working on. And so uh, you know, it's a matter of you know, having coming to- We are off topic. Well, we're talking about- Mr. Press, okay. Mr. Press, oh. this is on for, for committees relative to the district and its operation, the ones you're connected uh, to. For resources, there's- me, sir. Perfect, me. perfect resource. Just Those are great up. resources, and as Mr. Hoffman said, he'd look forward to talking to you about these. It's just not at this point, okay? Happy to meet right. with you. Told us some exciting You're stuff. Willing to come. Thank you. Okay.
other items from the floor? Oh, um, I saw, I had a committee report. Oh, I am sorry. <laughs> uh, it's, I don't know if it's an actual official committee other than I think it's gonna be ongoing with the Student Equity Council and Black Student Union. Um, oh yes. Ms. Espinosa and I met with the group last week. We had some amazing, courageous conversations and I look forward to their input, which is invaluable. Another set of eyes and ears making sure that uh, we are truly staying focused on our mission and serving all of our students, especially those of highest needs. Um, just such a dynamic group. So just wanted to recognize them. Thank you. I apologize. Um, I missed that meeting. So I, um, but I will be meeting with them myself actually. So thank you. Um, other items from the floor. We can start with you, Ms. Allen. I'll go backwards now. Okay. <laughs> um, so I, I would like to just sort of make a statement as, as the items from the floor and just address it to all of my wonderful Elk Grove Unified School District Committee. I've proudly represented our school district for the last eight years. You know me, you know my values and my heart. I have and will always continue to defend the rights of women in this community. I will continue to fight and defend the rights of all of our students and families, especially those that are underrepresented and have the greatest needs like our black students, our immigrants, our refugees, our English language learners, our students with disabilities and more. My eight years of service to this great district stands for itself. I am a champion for social justice and I will defend others when they are attacked. This is a continuation of harassment that I have faced from Elk Grove Mayor Steve Lee for years. The attacks on my character increased when I joined other local women in denouncing Mr. Lee's behavior. There is no truth to any of the attacks on my character. I have never made statements denigrating the Hmong culture or people. I love and respect the Hmong community as I do with all cultures. And as I said, I have and will continue to defend the rights of women in this community to participate free from harassment and abuse. I just wanted to make that statement. Thank you. <laughs> I have an item. Mr. Fortina. Uh, I know we've uh, been talking about some uh, heavy, heavy issues with associated with our distance learning, but there is an issue that I do believe that we should uh, address before our children start back to school again. And that specifically uh, is the dress code. The dress code as currently written is discriminatory towards women and minorities. Just have to read it and you know who is being singled out. And I would like to have a representative group of people uh, give input into the existing um, dress code and submit recommendations for changes to that dress code. Are dress codes handled school by school, Mr. Hoffman? There's a district P. Mr. Hoffman, you froze. I said there, there, there's a district component to it um, as well as um, school pieces, but we can, we can definitely take a look at that. Thank you, know, you, Madam Chair. I just want to second that. I'm interested in that as well. And there are some excellent gender neutral policies we can um, I would like to add on to Mr. Fortuna's comment that um, I think before we do start Zoom meetings and, and we expand into our older students, um, we should definitely point out um, some basic facts of Zoom etiquette being taught at the beginning of our school. I hope that's addressed. I don't mean to steal your time, Mr. Fortuna. Yeah, then, then um, um, associated with that, and, and it really, it, it goes to 
many, many policies, but this one in particular, to the extent that schools uh, uh, apply the dress code uh, differently, becomes a discriminatory act unto itself. If I can dress one way at a school and not be allowed to dress that way at another school, then that should stop. Uh, that shouldn't be allowed. We have many policies that are ignored um, and implemented in different ways in, in different schools. Uh, every time we apply a requirement differently, then that opens the door of discriminating against that individual student. But uh, in this case, it's, uh, it's overdue and it's an appropriate time to do it. Thank you. Mr. Perez, you had a comment? Yes, I agree with that. I've been trying to get you guys to agree with me four votes to get a student uh, rights booklet for them. So they would know their rights to do this and do that. It's too vague. That was one of the issues that I wanted to bring up. Address code, there's very many issues that need me to be addressed in the rights of students. That's one. So anyway, here's the latest. COVID-19 cases among US children jumped 40% in late July. Now they have, it's not COVID-19, they have another uh, respiratory issue, sickness that the uh, medical uh, community is recognizing and, and very keeping keen uh, uh, data sets on is this uh, this new sickness and it's uh, and it's going around throughout California, Florida and Arizona affecting the respiratory systems. So we need to keep abreast on this this particular issue and um, we have a lot of students or, or a lot of community uh, talk about dismantling systematic racism in public education. And we have a board member that's very modest who's gonna be presenter and that's Dr. Martinez. So <laughs> Ms. Martinez, are you gonna make that announcement? I was going to, but I didn't have time. I didn't want to interrupt the other comments. Um, <laughs> I wasn't so. sure. So anyway, that's going to be <laughs> Wednesday, August 19th, 2020, 1 p.m. to 2.30 Pacific Standard Time, location Zoom. And so uh, you would have to um, register at through www clsba.org. That's the California School Board Association website, right? Miss Dr. Martinez? Uh, yes. Okay. Can we so let I've, Dr. Martinez talk about it now, Mr. Press? Oh, yes, okay. Thanks. Go ahead. So I was contacted um, by the California School Board Association, Latino, um, or the president from the Latino Association, asking if I could participate as well as the CSBA president in the panel. I know it's the same day as our board workshop, but they wanted, they were asking if I could give um, just some background information um, because of the population I represent, Native American. So I, I um, will be helping or assisting with the panel, but there's different um, leaders that will be participating as well. Um, and so I, I appreciate the extension of the opportunity to be able to um, partake in this discussion. And um, there's a flyer, flyer circulating I also wanted to bring up another item from the floor. Um, I know right now um, I've been in other meetings regarding ethnic studies and um, there were some things regarding the curriculum that was brought up to me. Um, and so I, I know other communities um, are addressing some of the lessons. So I just wanted to bring that forth, just mention that. Um, as I know forth or as I gather more information, I'll definitely bring that back to share with all of you. And as a last final comment, I would just like to I um, appreciate uh, my colleague, Bobby Singh Allen, for the comments she's made as well. I've served alongside her um, for the last few years and can attest to her work ethic and also partaking in her a lot of her work she's done with CSBA as well as a delegate assembly member for our school district um, in which that she has been able to share 
her values um, with our school, other school districts as well, and learn from them, but also bring a voice um, to important matters in the community. So I wanted to um, just mention that in final comments. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations on your speaking, um, your future speaking. That sounds very exciting and recognizes your hard work. Is that an event that would be a CSBA event we would look at, or is that something that is open to the public? We've talked about it in public, so if people would actually want to see. It's open to the public. You can actually go online to register. It's that CLSBA.org. Yeah. I just send it to everybody, so the flyer the flyer's in your email box. Okay. Any registration required? Yes, please. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Espinosa. Did you have something? Hold on here. I'm not finished. Oh. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, the the the, the coalition of people of color, all the pres board presidents, you know, uh, Dr. Martinez will be represented, Native American, the Asian community is going to be represented, the African American, a uh, Black School Association is going to be represented, uh, Shonali Cruz Gonzalez, uh, uh, who is the president uh, president president of the California School Board. Uh, pres uh, Association is going to be one of the panelists, and uh, Oscar De La Torre representing the California Latino School Board Association. So it's going to be an excellent a panel that's going to be well representing people of color and their experiences and, and solutions. Well, uh, just recently, I want to thank you, the staff, regarding distance learning, participation, connectivity rates. Uh, you know, um, I don't know. I think the participation rates or some staff should have been on campus or talking to our students prior to school opening because, you know, David Reese, 103 students not connected, but they fixed it. Now they have only 18. Anna Kirchgater, who that's too high. What do you call it? Kennedy, 156. Now there's only six. We're so doing good. Reese, 103, now 18. So anyway, we need to improve this, these numbers. Mr. Perez, I, I would like to point out, and I appreciate you recognizing the work that's been done. We have over 10,000 students that started school and we are currently, well, as of the 10th, we were at 51 we had not made contact with, so. I think that's you know what, these figures the are a little bit look forward to. I agree. The numbers are a little bit bigger. Excuse than me, sir. Last March. Excuse me. What? Yes. With higher numbers to start with, but I think it's very important you appreciated that we got on it right away. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And again, I'd say we are, the staff's done a great job in trying to connect with those folks. The other piece to realize at the beginning of the school year, there's always some kids that uh, we don't connect with because they moved over the summer. So some of these kids, there, there's a normal um, rate at the beginning of the year of kids that have moved. So we're actually following up, the sites are doing it, follow up with district office. If those kids are there, we're gonna find them. Uh, but some of them- Cut out. They may have- you, you, you cut out, if some of those kids are, if any of those kids are there, we're gonna find them. Correct, so they're, if they're there, still there we're going to find them but some of the families may have moved it, it's a natural thing at the beginning of the year that there are there are no shows um at any beginning of the year so the work that was done from the 661 number down to 51 that was the work of our site staff uh, with supported district going and finding families right very good very good anyway i, I think I, I i shared this report closing the k-12 digital divide in the age of distance learning by common sense. I would like you to pass this report to all the board members and staff so they can read it, be knowledgeable about the issues and some of the things that we could do. You know, like California ranks second in the nation behind Texas for having the highest population of students and teachers lacking adequate internet connections and devices at home. Okay, so anyway, we okay. need to resolve that issue. Okay, I got a report that two of our employees tested positive. Well, a week ago, when you were at the at the 
schools in the opening day, I was watching the news and, you know, and I saw that they were uh, distributing Chromebooks at a particular elementary school and I brought it to the attention of, of the staff there at the administration office that the teacher, and, you know, she was acting in good faith. She was happy to see the students, but yet she did not have a mask and she was not within six feet of the students and she was happy to see them, you know, and she gave a friendly hug behind them on, on live channel 31. So we need to make sure that our staff knows that to wear a mask every day, every day they need the uh, mask. Agreed. And we just we actually just sent those reminders out to the entire staff uh, right. right at the end of last week. So uh, we're all we're on the same page, Mr. Price. Yes. Yeah. So anyway, just we need to reinforce that maybe every working day or whatever, because you know people just forget. I you know they just uh, so happy to see these kids again on campus. And also. The hotspots report was an excellent one that you gave us Tuesday, today, in fact. And uh, the report has a map. And that's an excellent way to analyze the issue on the hotspots or any kind of uh, district level reporting. If you use the mapping GIS software doing this, you could see, you could visually see where these hotspots are being placed and that are, most of them are in area one and area three, you know? They're, and they're, all, they're, also, all over, they're all over the district, Mr. Perez. Exactly, uh, right. Also uh, in that report, it says, it's not only a poverty issue, it's a rural issue. So yes, we do have great. a lot of rural issues regarding connectivity and hotspots, so in that report, you'll see that. I learned that. So, well, I actually knew that because telemedicine issue that I know. So in rural areas, yes, there's connectivity issues. And I want you to be aware of that and continue working very hard on those hotspots and closing the K-12 digital divide in the age of distance learning. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Mate, Mr. Mate, and the safety security team, the technology team, and our site leaders have done a great job in getting that work done. That's right. Thank Keep you, Mr. Wood. Bruce. Give them some more support and overtime. <laughs> All right. Mr. Madison, did you have anything to add? No, I have nothing. I haven't gone yet. And Ms. Cheris Espinoza. You are muted. Thank you. Very quickly, um, I just want to take this occasion to mark the fact that since February or so, we, the entire district, everybody in the EGSD family has been working at a breathless pace, round the clock in many situations, to figure out how to deal with this pandemic. And we passed a major milestone recently um, with what I will call the successful restart of instruction this year, based on all the feedback I've gotten. Um, you know, students, families have noticed the improvements that we've made in distance learning over the summer. Um, so I just I want to appreciate all the work that's gone into that. Um, and the students and their parents for an open mind and their adaptability. Um, and uh, just, you know, thank everyone for willing, being willing to work with us um, and understanding that we are um, doing the absolute best that is possible for them given the circumstances that we're in. So uh, I just think everyone needs to take a moment, pause, and appreciate um, what is working before we go back to redouble our efforts at plugging all the holes that we've talked about in this meeting today and, and all of the others that we didn't even get a chance to get to. So thank you, everyone. Okay, along those lines, I just wanted to make a quick comment. Um, we have had people that have come to our um, their place of work and their office every single day since this started in March. Um, our cabinet, our support staff here at district office, we have support staff out at schools that are coming and um, our food service, you cannot say enough about the things they have done for our students. 
So it would be remiss of me to not um, add on to Ms. Espinoza's very well said, always well said comments um, that we appreciate what everybody's going through. We know this is something new. Um, I never thought I'd be president of a school board, much less during a world pandemic when I was young, but I'm also who knew I'd have triplets. So life hands you, hopefully what we can all handle um, together as a team, we will get through this. And please know that we have the best intentions for your child at all times, and we will continue to do our best work to make this impossible situation as positive and knowledge and, and available for these children to come out the best as possible. So thank you very much for everybody tonight. And I'm going to close this meeting at 9, 10 p.m. Please stay safe and take care.